Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first meeting of the Sepsis Comprehensive Center Charité in Berlin. We are in a very special situa situation and we try to make a, a virtue out of a need. This is an empty lecture hall because there is no public here. But given the importance of our topic also in the context of the current COVID-19 crisis, we felt that it's necessary to hold this symposium. It's my pleasure now to introduce the Dean of the Faculty of the Charité here in Berlin, Professor Axel Pries, who is a physiologist and he also knows quite a lot about sepsis because his research was dedicated to the microcirculation, which plays an important issue in this field. Professor, please, please, please. Thank you very much, Professor Reinhardt. Dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to open this event here, even if it's an event under very sincere and different uh, conditions from the outside. But that makes it even more important to consider the topic of the event, the sepsis and the relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Charity is uh, very happy to be able, together with the Stiftung Charity, to host this event and to make sure that everything is done from a scientific and a clinical perspective to attack this problem and to try to solve it as fast as possible with all means which are available in a house where many researchers, many clinicians from very different disciplines join their forces together to address this problem. So I wish you all possible success, both for you as a group, for the charity, but also for the entire population. Uh, be successful and have a very good meeting. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure now to announce uh, Professor Eva Rhodes who is the president of the Berlin Medical Society, which is a very prestigious scientific society, and he will tell us a little bit more about it, him and the society. I know him since the early 70s, where we worked together because he's a pharmacologist by training in the, what at this time was called the Klinikum Stetis. Professor Rhodes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Reinhardt. Indeed, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to welcome you very heartily on behalf of the Berlin Medical Society. Our society is one of the supporters of uh, this uh, great event today. And I met, as you have already said, Professor Reinhardt already in the, uh, on Warset in the 1980s uh, at the Klinikum uh, Steglitz. And uh, he was an anesthesiologist, and I'm a clinical pharmacologist. Professor Claudia Spies was also there. She is now on the board of our society and director of the Charité Clinic of uh, Anesthesiology. Our society, the Berliner Medizinische Gesellschaft, originated from the first part of the 19th century. Its foundation dates back to 1844. This was a time when modern medicine took its early start, when anesthesia was invented and Ignaz Semmelweis advised doctors to rigidly observe asepsis. <clears throat> Moreover, the century of bacteriology began. Anesthesia, asepsis, and infection are still keywords of a modern look at sepsis. From the very start on, the Berlin Medical Society had presentations and discussions on epidemics. You can see on the slide, cholera epidemics in 1848, 
and uh, young Virchow was one of the contributors. He was uh, 27 years old at that time. Then Clark and Typhus, influenza, Marburg fever after uh, the war in 1988, uh, presented by Professor Gustav Adolf Martini, and uh, other recent reports were done on AIDS, BSE, bioterrorism, avian flu, Ebola, and less than three weeks ago, we had uh, here a um, very big meeting also on uh, COVID-19, uh, together with Brother Drosten and uh, others. The following lectures of this symposium will teach us, I think, that science and will finally overcome all challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Roots. Now I hand over to the two moderators uh, of this meeting, who are at the same time are also leaders of uh, two working groups of our center. This is Professor Wolfgang Kübler, who is also a physiologist by training, who has done a lot of research in the field uh, of sepsis. And this is Professor uh, Martin Witzenrath, who is the vice chair of the Department of Infectiology and Normology. And he has also done great research in the field of uh, pneumonia, the main cause uh, of sepsis, and also in sepsis. Please take over. Thank you very much. Uh start with the scientific uh, program now, I'd like to make a quick remark as we were already asked here whether it is possible to pose questions. Now, it's pretty weird here in a completely uh, empty lecture hall, but we would appreciate your questions so that we can get into a scientific discussion. And now it's my pleasure to announce our first speaker, um, who is uh, Professor Reinhardt. He is the president of the Global Sepsis Alliance and a senior professor here at Charité. Thank you. So as it has been said, uh, it's my pleasure that I am here in Berlin now uh, in this uh, position and uh, in my capacity also as uh, member and of the executive board uh, and president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. We had been working jointly with the authors of the Global Sepsis Report uh, for the first time to assess the global burden of sepsis. And what came out of this work were uh, astonishing facts so that at least annually in, 2000, in, in 2017, we had close to 49 million uh, sepsis cases uh, out of which uh, 11 million deaths were related to, uh, to sepsis. And this means that uh, close to 20% um, of all deaths worldwide are related to sepsis. Of course, there's variation between the, uh, of the burden of sepsis among the continents and the highest incidence ranging between 3,400 and 4,300 cases per 100,000 population uh, is occurring in sub-Saharan Africa, but also there is a big burden in some parts of Asia and also of uh, South America. How does this incidence compare to other major health threats, breast cancer, 110 per 100,000 population, colon cancer, 50 per 100,000, AIDS, this is number for Germany, 3.5 per 100,000 inhabitants. Sepsis is also a major issue, not only in resource poor settings, but also in countries like the United States and uh, Sweden and other high income countries. And two studies from these two countries, recent studies suggest that also there, there is an incidence between 500 
and 700 per 100,000 population. And globally, this report I just mentioned, published in The Lancet, came up with a median of 716 per 100,000 population. And Sir William Osler, one of the most famous physicians at his time, has pointed out at the turn of the 19th century that humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And he said, of these, by far, the greatest uh, and most terrible is fever, which is nothing else than at those time what was considered uh, a sepsis. And what he, it turned out that he was completely right. When we are talking about the Spanish flu, in the US, HN, H1N1 was diagnosed for the first time in 9018, until June 2000, uh, 19, 1920, about 50 million which people had died from the so-called Spanish flu, which meant 3% of the world population. This is more than the death rates from the First and the Second World War. And there was a big awareness on sepsis also between and during the Second World War. This is a poster issued by the British Ministry of Defense. And they warned their soldiers to wear Hitler's greatest ally called her septicemia, alias blood poisoning, which would use blitz methods. And they urged their soldiers to take care and to look for the first signs of sepsis and to treat it as an emergency. First aid was the word, first aid treatment, because if they would not do they, to do, if they would neglect these signs, they would help Hitler. So this awareness for sepsis, unfortunately, has dramatically changed. And this is a quote by the Surgeon General from the US in 1972. He mentioned that the book of infectious diseases can now be ultimately closed. Why was it? Because there was a tremendous decline, as you see on this picture here, on the left side, in the crude death rate from infectious diseases between 1900 and 1950, 1960, which was mostly due to better sanitation, chlorine of water, use of penicillin, vaccines, uh, etc., etc. What you see here is the peak uh, by the influenza pandemic, the Spanish flu. So we hope that the current crisis which is completely different because we have made a lot of advances, will not hit us, hit us in such way. And he was wrong, of course, not only globally, but also for the US. This is a quote by Bloomberg about one and a half year ago when data came out that the hospital costs for sepsis treatment in the US is the top runner with 27 billion, and they speak about a 27 billion sepsis crisis. And this is actual data by Drive, which is a body of the Department of Health of the US. And they closely work together with researchers. And this publication just came out um, in Critical Care Medicine a few days ago. And it, it says that more than 270,000 adult Americans die as a result of sepsis, and their, their overall cost is more than 62 billion, uh, which needed to be spent on healthcare costs. So, uh, ironically, although not only, also VIP people have died of sepsis, sepsis never had a lobby. And this had consequences just it came into my mind. When we convened in 1987, here in Berlin, the first international sepsis, sepsis and interdisciplinary uh, challenge, there was nothing out there in terms of data on the burden of sepsis. There were no data on the quality of sepsis care, no interest by any professional society, poor interest 
by industry, no patient advocacy groups, and no clinical practice guidelines. And this lack of awareness from the 70s on resulted also to the fact that when we did polls in 2013, that in most countries, less than 50% have ever heard the word sepsis. And in a recent poll that we did with 1,000 citizens aged above 65 or 60, which are most brown and endangered by sepsis, only 17% of the citizens knew that vaccination in some cases may help to prevent sepsis. 23% thought that sepsis results from an allergic reaction. 30% believed that sepsis primarily results from so-called killer bugs. And the respondents also believed that a red line on the arm, which moves to the heart, is a key symptom for sepsis. And this has impact on the behavior, this lack of knowledge. If you compare the vaccination rates for influenza and pneumococci between Germany, US, and UK, you see that in these other countries, for example, it's almost three times or two times as high as in our country. So this has to do how such issues are addressed. And what is also not known currently is to the lay people is that sepsis by definition is a life-threatening condition that arises when the body's response to an infection ensures its own tissue and organs. And that sepsis, if not treated promptly, leads to shock, multiple organ failure and death. And that's why it's needed to recognize early. And it was already Sir William Osler again who recognized and published that the right view that except on few occasions the patient seems to die from the body's response to infection rather than from it. And that's why we discuss currently, also in this meeting, potential effective approaches to cope and to deal with this damaging host response. Sepsis has been called as a billion dollar graveyard of pharmaceutical industry because over the last 20 years we were not able to treat these host response appropriately. But I think we will hear more about this during the meeting. And there's also a great variance between the absolute um, numbers in sepsis mortality and also the dynamics. In some countries like Australia, UK, US, there was a considerable reduction over the last year, and I'm talking now about severe sepsis. Unfortunately, country, uh, Germany is not among the countries uh, where we have this kind of dynamics. So we are unfortunately closer to Brazil and uh, uh, Turkey in this respect. And we must to admit that sepsis can be seen as a mirror of the quality of healthcare. So I think we are doing a great job in Germany right now to deal with this pandemic because there's this close discussion between experts like Christian Dorsten and the policymakers. And then I think no country has been done better in this, but we can be much better uh, in this system. And we also have a grow, great variation um, with it between the hospitals, and this is data from the state of New York, where Governor Cuomo in 2019 realized that your chance to survive sepsis is much better in these hospitals on the right-hand side than in these hospitals in the left-hand side. And the same is true in Germany. We also have a great variation in from mortality from severe sepsis in, in, in our country. And this is unacceptable. And this uh, reminds us that we need to take uh, action and that's what we are doing. What is also has been missing due to this lack of awareness uh, on sepsis, uh, which happened in the 70s, that sepsis was only mentioned in the Global Burden of Disease Report as, neo, as sepsis and other infectious disorders of the newborn babies. Lower respiratory tract infections was also and uh, the number one cause of life loss by cause in 2010. And no, now 
everybody should acknowledge and know that you won't die from lower respiratory tract infection if it does not move forward. That's why we asked as GSA and worked later on also with these people to bring out this global burden of disease regard also on sepsis where you have seen um, uh, before. We, all, we had to learn from cancer and other fields because they recognized already in the 40s of the last century that for any illness to rise to political prominence, it needed marketing. A disease needed to be transformed politically before it could be transformed scientifically. scientifically. You can read this in this fascinating uh, book, The Emperor of All uh, Maladies. And they ask, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer in the newspapers. They ask for a moonshot for cancer. And things have changed and they have Cancer is not defeated yet, but we have much better outcomes now. We also can and should learn a lot from, from the success in the fight against AIDS. This is a, a screenshot that I did yesterday uh, from this website uh, on global US uh, global statistics, where you can read, if you can read it, that AIDS-related deaths have been reduced by more than 55% since the peak in 2004. In 2018, around 770,000 people died from AIDS-related illnesses worldwide compared to 1.2 million in 2010 and 1.7 million in 2004. So you can make a difference. And this happened because there was a global effort from all societal and industry and other uh, uh, other uh, groups and bodies. We have been asking for Germany in 2013 on recommendation of the current uh, Chancellor Minister Angela Merkel, Helge Braun, who is an intensivist and who knows and has treated patients with sepsis, that we should ask for an action plan in Germany against sepsis because we extrapolated that at least 15 to 20,000 sepsis deaths are preventable in Germany. And we also lobbied strongly with the German Minister of Health and other nations to get a resolution by the WHO that recognizes sepsis as a global health authority. And this is a quote by Sir Lyman, Liam Donaldson who said that very important clinical issues like sepsis too long have been in the backwaters. And he said that the public and political space is a space in which sepsis needs to be in order for things to change. That's why in 2012 we created as Global Sepsis Alliance, the World Sepsis Day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this resolution indeed guides us and helps us because it urges member states to include prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of sepsis in national health systems, strengthening and in community and in healthcare settings. And this resolution was also very important because it made clear that most types of microorganisms can cause sepsis, including bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites, such as those that cause malaria. And, what, and this recent paper that just came out in the Lantern from China makes this clear that those who died from sepsis, uh, from uh, COVID-19, 100% died from sepsis, uh, and even more had sepsis as uh, RDS. So we are dealing with just another pathogen uh, which, may, uh, uh, which may cause sepsis. It's also important that in the meanwhile, also, um, WHO addresses sepsis more vigorously and talks about it. And Dr. Tetris called it a tragedy that most of the six million deaths among them one million babies, and we now more than know that's 11 million deaths, are preventable. Preventable by vaccination, clean care, early recognition, and treatment of sepsis as an emergency. And it was help, very helpful that there are, were a lot of families and survivors who no longer were willing, who put pressure on policymakers in US, in UK, and in other countries that something needs to be happen, happen. And Governor Cuomo in 2013 declared the fight against sepsis. He issued a mandate 
that all hospitals in the state of New York, 197 hospitals, needed to follow certain guidelines and rec recommendations. And the results of this were published four years later in the New England German, uh, uh, Journal, showing that every hour counts. The faster you treat with antimicrobials, the lower is the mortality rate. And what this data also showed that those 70,000 patients who were treated along this protocol, there was a decrease by 5% in overall hospital mortality, whereas there was a trend to even a somewhat higher mortality in those patients who did not, did not get this. In children, this is another publication uh, uh, from, from from the state of New York and, and colleagues uh, from us. The mortality rate in the age group of zero to 17 years was 11.8% overall in those where these bundles have been completed. It was 7.5% compared to 13.2% um, where the bundle was not completed. When we looked, when we looked, on, the when we looked on the mortality rate in Germany in the same age group, it was 17.2%. So we have a lot of improvement, and I'm sure that in many other countries who have no data at all on sepsis, uh, this uh, data might be similar. In, in countries where, in this case, UK, NIH, um, and the director of NIH said, NIH unites to tackle sepsis. They were able to increase the number who get their antimicrobials in the first hour from 30% between 2016 to 90% in 2018, and this resulted in a decrease in mortality absolutely by more than 10%. This is a result from a national report done in Ireland, who also have trained every hospital in this small country, and you see also that hospital mortality also declined there. This is from a hospital group in New York State. And this gentleman, the CEO, were, was among us when we launched in 2010 the Global Sepsis Alliance, decided to address sepsis in his hospital group. And you see that over three years, or no, over seven years, uh, that there was a constant decrease in sepsis mortality. It's also possible in Germany. This is the data uh, from the University Hospital uh, in, uh, in the University of Greifswald, where the whole hospital joined together and was supported by the board of directors and all disciplines, and they were able to decrease this mortality. So, to finish, this report on sepsis that came out recently means another quantum leap in the fight against sepsis because it underpins the tremendous human and economic burden of sepsis. It helps policymakers, health authorities, and healthcare providers to prioritize their prevention and treatment strategies accordingly. And infection prevention and sepsis must become and remain a keystone in any international and national health strategy, not only during global health crisis. And we are sitting together here at Virchow Week 9, where this lecture hall is. And Rudolf Virchow made the claim that medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. He also said that sepsis has the obligation to point out the problem. The politician, the practical anthropologist, must find the means for the actual solution. And lastly, he said that the physicians are the natural advocate of the poor and social problems fall to a large extent within their jurisdiction. So these quotes were never more true than today. Thank you for your kind attention.
I'm very thankful for this uh, question because indeed we are the champions. We have more ICU beds than the US, but you can't solve problems on the ICU. If your patients come too late with multiple organ failure, it's very hard to change things around because it's as you see, it's a dying is related uh, on an hourly basis like organ damage with myocardial infarction or strokes. So, and we are not very good in the outpatient setting because you must be aware 80% of sepsis patients come from the community to the hospitals. Our emergency systems, except for the Charité and some other well-organized hospitals, in Germany is a disaster. And this has been recognized also by our Minister of Health. So we will need to change this. And we have no national programs if you look at the vaccination rates, um, to educate people, we are very well educated about sexual transmitted diseases. You learn at, it, at every bus stop, and it's great. But we need to do the same thing for those in this population above age 50 and other risk for patients. What are the early signs of sepsis, and what can they do to um, prevent it? So, so this. And in, in the hospitals, we need to learn, we still have reanimation teams. In Australia, no hospital is accredited which does not have a, a sepsis response team. You have been to Canada, uh, US, UK. They all have a res rapid response team and they educate their healthcare workers in national early warning scores. And this is not the case at all. No nurse and no physician may start working in a hospital who has not learned to recognize the vital signs which suggest that, that somebody is in a life threatening state. And, and we need to systematically teach this. And this we can't do alone to the intensivists. I was naive when I started as an intensivist. And we brought it to the table. This is a credit of the intensivists because we have seen how difficult things are if the patients, as you know, are in multiple organ failure. So, but we must start earlier, and, we, we, and, and that's why we need everybody on board. Sepsis is an interdisciplinary issue. So it's a question of awareness and training in the professional sector? Because if you look at the global population or the national population, the awareness in Germany is probably higher than in any other country if you compare to North America or to the UK, more people are aware yeah. in general of what sepsis is. But this is data from 2013. In the meanwhile, there's data from US and UK where close to 70 to 80% have not even heard the sepsis, uh, what sepsis is, but they better understand it also in the meanwhile because having heard from sepsis does not mean that uh, you also know uh, what sepsis is. So, yeah. Now, with respect to uh, COVID-19, I think everyone is very interested in this topic, uh, also with respect to sepsis. Now, um, of the very few people who die from, relatively few people uh, who die from COVID-19, some of them die due to um, lung injury primarily, some of them due to uh, heart uh, uh, problems and circulatory problems, but some of them get sepsis. And uh, what do you think? Is this sort of a virus-induced cytokine storm sepsis, a viral sepsis, or no, do they have no. a bacterial infection? Yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, I, and, and that's why I shortly mentioned that I, I think Dr. Riedemann will address it more. This Lancet paper clearly shows that you have all features uh, uh, of sepsis. By definition, sepsis is defined as an infection which causes organ disease. Uh, 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 organ dysfunction, and this may happen with the lung, this may happen with the liver, with the heart, with vasodilatation, and, and with the brain. So, so that's why, yeah, so, so, so the severe cases which require any form of organ dis uh, support by definition, and this is the message of this Lancet paper that I have shortly decided. Okay, with a look uh, on the watch, I would say Thank you very much again. Pleasure. And we should move on. And we're happy to introduce our next speakers. And that's Dr. Bourgeois and Dr. Bergmann from Hennigsdorf, Berlin.
and they will present on precision medicine, innovations in diagnosis and therapy of sepsis. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So uh, today I and my colleague Deborah Sorry. will present a little bit on um, diagnostic. While you, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Like that? Okay. Yes. We'll present a little bit on um, diagnostic and treatment towards precision medicine. So sepsis, as Professor Reinhardt just mentioned, is still the killer number one in intensive care units. Even after the development and routine use of the procalcitonin, the PCT test, um, the uh, number of sepsis deaths actually did not decrease. For example, in Germany, we have about 200 deaths a day. So um, what we are focused on is actually what are the mortality drivers in sepsis. And to you know, start with this, we would like to start first in order to have a look at the septic patient and what cl clinical picture do we see in these patients. So you may have a patient presenting in the ICU who has fever and chills, have an altered mental status, a fast respiratory response and low blood, uh, blood pressure, all taken together making the quick sofa score. And you may diagnose your patient with sepsis. So over the course of sepsis, yeah, over the course of sepsis, um, you start initiating antibiotic treatment uh, and start monitoring your patient closely. So over the course of the patient, um, the patient may develop hemodynamic instability, uh, which require vast amounts of vasopressors to stabilize your patient. And over the time, the patient may experience also a volume shift vascular leakage that presents as massive edema. Furthermore, the patient may show reduced diuresis, which may be signs of acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury a reduced uh, renal function, but may also be due to the fact I just mentioned that you have vascular leakage. Over the time, the patient may also run into a sudden cardiac depression and worst case, sudden death. So when we look at this scenario, these are basics, or these are usually taken as signs of endothelial, um, loss of endothelial function, declining renal function, and among others, cell death. So based on extensive biobank research, our findings lead to the, uh, would, uh, we would like to highlight that basically, loss of endothelial function, renal decline, and cell death are the major drivers of, sep of mortality in sepsis. So first, in order to better understand what available diagnostics do we have today and what is routinely uh, performed in a septic patient, uh, we would like to emphasize that today we do have inflammation markers such as CRP, EL6, and also the procalcitonin to monitor a septic patient and guide uh, antibiotic therapy. Now, to better have a, understand what's the status of the patient with endothelial function, you know, the uh, low blood pressure and constant low blood pressure will give you a hint on um, where the patient is, as well as you can monitor uh, and recommend um, to use lactate as a marker for hypoxia uh, and hypoperfusion uh, of organs. So for renal um, dysfunction, you can use the urea, you frequently use the serum creatinine and urine output. Now for cell deaths, well, uh, subsequently there is nothing direct linked to that. You may also use here the lactate as a marker, an indirect marker of cell deaths as cells may die due to hypoxia. So um, basically, all the, um, these routinely used parameters are of course very helpful, but they're definitely mm -hmm. unspecific. And when it comes to kidney function, for example, glomerular gram filtration rates of the kidneys is very hard to measure. In four years, uh, this filtration rate has been estimated based on creatinine values. Creatinine, however, is very um, is basically contingent on many factors such as inflammation, which is very unfortunate in sepsis, and on top is actually delayed in comparison to actual kidney function. 
And what concerns cell death, this is usually not currently addressed in a routine manner in ICU. Now, based on years of research and blood-based analysis, we try to better understand these causes of mortality and sepsis and try to really focus on these three causes and develop tools in order to better understand and monitor a patient. So when it comes to uh, the loss of endothelial function, we identify a molecule which is called bioactive adrenomedulin, in short, bioADM. This is a repair hormone that when it's inside um, a blood vessel actually um, stabilizes the endothelial function, whereas if it's outside the blood vessel acting on smooth muscle cells, it is causing vasodilation, which can subsequently lead into shock. Um, when we talk about declining renal function, uh, uh, the molecule we identified is proencaphalin, uh, in short, PENKID. So proencaphalin is a pro-hormone fragment of encaphalin, which in turn is a kidney-stimulating hormone. Encaphalin levels in the blood very well and consistently mirrors the actual glomerular filtration rate. So it's important to mention that we make no estimation since the pro, uh, pinky levels in the blood, they're very consistent with uh, what is actually happening in the kidney. And finally, and very important factor is that uh, PENKID levels are independent from inflammation, which is an essential point in sepsis. To better understand cell deaths, we screen for quite some molecules in order to better understand what is actually happened and what is released up in uncontrolled cell deaths. And we found that there is a uh, an enzyme called the D-peptidyl-peptidase 3, in short DPP3, which is a uh, relatively new uh, finding uh, at the core of a recently discovered disease mechanism. So the DPP3 is a cardiodepressant factor. It is an enzyme that is usually located within the cell, but up in massive and uncontrolled cell death, it is released into the circulation where it is um, incorporating its um, substrates such as angiotensin II and starts to degrade them. Well, so once we have identified all these key molecules that we call biomarkers, we very thoroughly characterize them using more than 50,000 patients, more than 100 clinical studies, 30 indications, 20 countries, and more than 650 study centers. And together with our collaboration partners, we did publish all these findings in peer-reviewed journals, more than 50 publications to date, and we're currently working with physicians and national and international hospitals in order to better understand how we can translate our research into a routine setting, and this is called the Lighthouse Project. So now I will enter a little bit more in detail. So basically, after years of researching sepsis, I would like to summarize a little bit our findings on the mortality drivers in this field. So it's also important that what I'm going to say next, you shouldn't understand as isolated pathways, but rather that these pathways can happen in parallel. So I will start with what is known, the trigger, which is the infection, which, for example, nowadays can be assessed by PCT or procalcitonin levels in the blood. As um, a reaction of a normal reaction of our immune system, systemic inflammation takes place. So many patients during their hospital journey or their hospital stay develop complications and show symptoms of multi-organ failure. And depending on the um, severity of their state, they end up dying. So what I would like to focus now is what happens in between. What are the actual mortality drivers in sepsis? So an important aspect of sepsis is loss of endothelial function. Loss of endothelial function leads to shock and vascular leakage. This process can be easily identified by bioADM levels in blood. Once shock and vascular leakage happens, 
um, loss of organ perfusion takes place, which opens the door to multiple organ failure. Once the patients are in this state, they of course need treatment. And this brings me to the second important pathway. So when these patients are treated, treated with their normal therapy, a sepsis therapy such as antibiotics and vasopressors, these therapies also harm the kidney to different extent. And we then observe declining renal function, and this can be very well seen by the pancreas levels in the blood. Once the kidneys start failing, this then uh, consequently will lead to multiple organ failure. As a final pathway, I would like to highlight cell death. And cell death actually happens a lot, especially in the very critical states of sepsis and septic shock, mainly due to exacerbated immune response and um, exacerbated immune response and, of course, um, hypoperfusion, so lack of oxygen. So basically, when cells die in like a large amount, lots of enzymes are like put out of the cells and they end up in the blood. And one of these very important enzymes is DPP3, which is a fairly non-myocardial depressant factor. And DPP3 release leads then to the loss of heart function. And once the heart starts failing, this will affect other organs and lead to the same pathway. So again, we should keep in mind that all these pathways may happen in parallel, but for uh, now we're going to focus on the endothelial function and the bioactive adrenomedaline. So bioADM is a marker for endothelial function, which allows us to early identify and monitor patients who experience a loss of endothelial function. So to understand why bioactive adrenomedulins uh, play such an important role in um, septic patients, we sh first of all should have a look at a healthy state. So what you see here is um, a, like the endothelial cells in, in light pink surrounded by smooth muscle cells in red. So you're actually looking at the blood vessel and um, in a healthy individual, bioADM is produced in normal amounts. So having two functions, one um, stabilizing the endothelium, um, the bioADM acts on the endothelial cells and uh, keeps them tight. So your patient is not presenting with any edema. So on the other hand, as the bioADM is such a small molecule, it can actually freely diffuse between the compartments and can also go outside the blood vessel where it's acting on smooth muscle cells. So here in a healthy individual, it is contributing to a normal blood pressure. Now going back to our septic patient, you can see that the light pink cells, so the endothelial cells, um, they form uh, like holes within the endothelial barrier. So the body tries to repair this using bioADN and starts to produce more of that in order to repair the barrier function. Now, due to the systemic inflammation, it doesn't work completely, so the patient presents with massive edema. So due to the fact that this body is actually producing so much bioADM, it is also acting more on these smooth muscle cells, causing high um, vasodilation and then blood pressure drop and subsequent shock. So now, we know that bioADM has these two functions, so one positive in order to restore barrier function and control barrier function, and on the other hand, vasodilatory functions on the outside. So uh, we're not only looking at our biomarkers at own biomarkers, but also as biotargets. So the company Adrenomed has developed an antibody that is actually targeting bioADM and is injected into the blood circulation where it binds the bioADM and has the possibility to translocate the bioADM from outside, the, so the interstitium inside the blood circulation, and it keeps it active. So inside the blood vessel, bioADM can actually act on the endothelial cells and restore barrier function and reduce uh, vasodilation. So this is all something I would like to emphasize is that Adrenomid just finished a phase two trial 
um, in septic shock patients, which Professor Mibasa is just going to reveal first time results of this trial after our talk. Now, what you can do today already using BioADM as a diagnostic tool is again when we have a look at the septic patient and you uh, see a blood pressure drop in these patients, how, how does the BioADM help you here? So, BioADM blood concentrations rise prior to the blood pressure drop and that up to two days earlier. So, it allows you to catch the first hour to treat the patient properly. Furthermore, bioedema is a very dynamic molecule allowing the monitoring of the patient and if the bioedema values does not go down, this identifies treatment non-responders and if it goes down, you can uh, say that your treatment is actually successful. So this allows you to timely consult other experts such as the surgeon in example in order to localize the infection to guide vasopressor and fluid therapy, and in future to guide targeted therapy such as the adricizumab. I would like now to focus on the DPP-3 pathway. So um, DPP-3 is a very important and very valuable biomarker that early identifies high-risk patients in, uh, with risk of cardiac depression. So, DPP-3, actually, it's an enzyme that in the health state is inside the cell, and it's compartmentalized in the cell and therefore does not see its substrate in the bloodstream, such as angiotensin-2. Angiotensin-2 is a very important peptide hormone that uh, uh, is responsible for hemodynamic instab uh, stability and cardiac function. In a disease state, such as sepsis, but also in burns, trauma, and surgeries where massive de cell death occurs, DPP-3 is released in the extracellular space and ends up in the blood. DPP-3 will then uncontrollably digest angiotensin-2, leading to cardiac depression and hemodynamic instability. So based on the fact that this enzyme is active in the blood, our hypothesis was that what happens if we block this enzyme, we will be able to restore angiotensin two levels and cardiac function. And the answer is yes. So we developed an antibody that when injected intravenously can block the PP3 in the bloodstream and normalize angiotensin two levels and consequently uh, rescues cardiac function. So basically our experience with this biomarker by measuring many patients in the ICU is that uh, DPP-3 release is triggered by an injury to our body, an injury that causes massive cell death. Once this happens, DPP-3 rises rapidly in the blood between 12 and 24 hours. These patients will then be in a situation that they have hemodynamic instability and cardiac depression, and at this time point, therapy escalation is started. So patients that respond well to this therapy will show low, de or the DPP-3 levels will reduce in the blood, and, but also very quickly in an interval of 12 to 24 hours and low DPP-3 concentrations in the blood are associated with positive outcome, normalized heart function. However, if these patients do not respond well to therapy and the DPP-3 plasma levels remain high, this is highly associated with cardiac dysfunction, um, multiple organ failure, and, and short-term mortality. So in this setting, we could, we could say that DPP-3 is an excellent biomarker to assess patient severity in the ICU, definitely guide escalation therapy as well as differential vasopressor and inotropic therapy, and lastly, guidance of innovative therapies. Uh, I also should mention that most of what is published on DPP-3 is on cardiogenic shock, but we have very recently shown the importance of DPP-3 in sepsis and also the really um, important role of the uh, DPP-3 blocking antibody in rescuing heart function in animal models. So now looking at the third pathway, we're targeting um, the kidney function 
uh, I would like to give you some deeper insights in pro and kefalin and as a biomarker to assess the true GFR. Again, it is not an estimation on the glomerular filtration rate, but actually mirroring what is going on in the kidney right now. But first, let's take a step back. So proenkephalin is a prohormone fragment that's actually produced by heart and kidney, and once in the circulation, is uh, yeah, split it into the enkephalin, which is the active um, uh, hormone uh, stimulating kidney function, and the, uh, yeah, the um, proenkephalin a connecting peptide that's actually measurable. So the enkephalin stimulates kidney function, and what we measure is a stable fragment of this to indirectly know the enkephalin concentration. So again, when it comes to a course of aseptic patients, what we have today to monitor our kidney function is the serum creatinine, which may rise. So once this rises, you have to, per definition, you have the acute kidney injury. And over the course um, of the patient on ICU, this may go down. So how does the PANKID aid in, in uh, diagnosis today? So as it's mirroring the true GFR, it is up to two days earlier than what we have as standard of care today. And being a very dynamic marker, it allows also the treatment um, and, and patient monitoring, if uh, concentrations stay elevated, you know that the kidney function is not recovering, whereas the PENKID levels go down, this indicates improvement in renal function also up to two days earlier than standard of care can do this today. So these early information will aid you to initial, initiate um, the guidance of nephrotoxic drugs earlier, um, start nephroprotective strategies, and on top, actually, PENKID is a biomarker that is still valid under dialysis, allowing a start and stop decisions uh, in these patients. So this is like an add-on slide, considering the critical corona crisis uh, we're facing right now. So as has been widely reported so far, so um, the clinical spectrum of this COVID-19 patients varies from asymptomatic to very critical um, clinical situation, including uh, acute respiratory failure and support in an intensive care unit. Critically ill patients, so corona critically ill patients, which accounts now to five, five to 8% of these patients, besides presenting with acute respiratory failure, these patients also present with sepsis and multiple organ failure. So here, it's a clear parallel to what we have been discussing today. And we would like to highlight that the pathways we talked about are not only applicable to patients that undergo sepsis, but rather to every critical patient that we see in the ICU. And not only following um, the, the call of the World Health Organization, we've been initiating uh, and working together with clinicians in order to um, introduce our knowledge into <clears throat> clinical practice and there we partner with national and international hospitals. We do routine implementations using our whole blood rapid point of care test in order to really learn from physicians what can we do differently uh, using our biomarkers and emphasize the publication of case reports and peer-reviewed um, data. So with this, we would really like to work closely together with clinicians in order um, to improve standard of care in sepsis and beyond uh, in critical care, uh, such as in the COVID-19 patients. So as our last slide, I would like to leave you with um, a summary of uh, our pathways that we identified as mortality drivers in sepsis, identifying our biomarkers by the MDPP trampin kit, but also the drugs that are on their way for example, adrocizumab that uh, is a potentiating antibody targeting bioadrenomedulin and procizumab, which is an inhibiting antibody targeting DPP3. The next talk will focus on the endothelial pathway and will specifically focus on adrocizumab. So um, thank you for your attention.
thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I would start the discussion with the first question. You showed very nice schematics how you think the biomarkers could be used to track the course of the disease. What is the actual data for the value of these biomarkers? For example, for bioactive adrenomedulin, how well does it correlate with vascular permeability as measured by plethysmography as sort of probably the key uh, gold standard for permeability in the clinic? So um, basically what I can um, offer as an answer here, we have extensively investigated these biomarkers in several clinical studies. Most of them were, of course, retrospective studies, so it was not possible for us to, for example, use certain techniques where we didn't have any data to analyze on. However, um, BioEDM has a clear added value on top of lactate, for example, that is recommended, and uh, it highly correlates with uh, congestion, with vascular leakage in sepsis, and this has been widely published in the literature. But that's what I was asking. How is vascular leakage measured in these studies? What's so we know from the concept, for example, we did um, cell um, experiments. So we had a, a endothelial cells uh, plated, and um, they were uh, you know, destroyed, and then we added on top bioactive adrenomedulin, and we, we saw that this is actually reformating the endothelial cells and stabilizing the endothelial function. I don't doubt about that, yeah. I mean, that's sort of well established in the field, but it's still a different thing to show that in a clinical situation it actually mm -hmm. works as a biomarker for a certain disease process or for a certain pathomechanism, uh, which I think is probably will still require prospective trials using specific mm -hmm. um, technologies to address this pathomechanism, but I think it's, it's an interesting step forward, yeah, to, to look at that. So we, we have several questions from the audience, and I would uh, like to repeat one or two. Uh, one is, uh, is DPP-3 also elevated in patients with chronic heart failure? Do you know anything? Um, actually not. So DPP-3 is not elevated in patients with chronic disease, at least uh, in the wide spectrum. Chronic disease we have measured so far, we did not see DPP-3 playing any role or uh, being able to um, uh, be associated with mortality or, or poor outcomes. DPP-3 is more um, a biomarker that is related to disease severity, to critical um, situations in the emergency department and intensive care units. Okay, and uh, thank you. And the next one uh, would be, uh, can any hospital join the so-called Lighthouse Project and how can one participate in these projects? Well, so uh, in principle, yes, so we do uh, like to work with clinics who would like to uh, work with us in order to better understand what's the clinical value and how they can treat patients differently. Um, so yes, so please feel free to contact us and uh, we will see how we can work together on that. And uh, another one is uh, on uh, the, um, uh, the question, how often shall one measure the biomarkers to get the most information. So what about the dynamics of these biomarkers? Okay, so most of these, so all these biomarkers we presented are highly dynamic. So they can be well used to monitor how the patient progress upon treatment, for example. And um, the most added value we see, for example, for DPP-3 is measuring DPP-3 at admission and 24 hours give a very good indication if the patient is moving the right or wrong direction. But for example, measuring bioEDM is also very important when you're making a decision about uh, vasopressor doses or vasopressor need in patients, and this can be uh, mirrored by the bioEDM levels. Thank you very much. I think for the sake of time, we have to move on. Thank you for the presentation. And the question is answered. And answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we would like to move on with our next speaker, um, uh, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Mibaza, and uh, 
He's located in Paris, and as far as I see, uh, he's already here and uh, connected with us. And he's going to talk about adversizumab, the targeted treatment of endothelial dysfunction in sepsis, and the results from the Adrenos 2 phase 2 trial. But you please need to share your screen with us. You have to share your screen with us. We don't see the, the movie. We don't see the clip. Excuse me? We don't see your screen. You have to share your screen with us. Okay. There's this square with the arrow in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I stop and I repeat. I'm really sorry. Okay. And like this, is it better? Yes. Is it better like this? Yes. Perfect. Sorry. What we see here, and what is really very, very important, is for the first time we are looking on endothelium as a main, uh, as a main part of brain sepsis. And here you see adrenal medley that is uh, released by many cells uh, all around the body. And uh, as you can see here, the endothelium that is usually the very strong barrier. Now, when adrenal medley is going to increase and come. With the, with the flow, there, there will be uh, endothelial uh, disruption. And we know that sepsis, endothelial disruption in uh, all the organs uh, is something that is really harmful because it would be uh, first a change in uh, vascular flow, a change in the contractility of the vessels, and a change in uh, the endothelial uh, barrier plasma uh, going outside. And here, adresiximab, the antibody is going to modulate, going to stick to adrenomethylene. The antibody is in blue, adrenomethylene is in yellow. Then adresiximab, the antibody, is going to stick to adrenomethylene and then it will stabilize again the endothelial function and it will 
restore the construction and stop all the uh, all the uh, dilation. And the idea is by restoring the figure function, by restoring all of us our function all around the body, we may uh, may move out of and this is what uh, this was the initial hypothesis and you will see that with the results uh, rather fit with this uh, initial hypothesis. And let me come back to uh, the slides. Do you, do you hear me well? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, we hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, then what we see here in the slide is what we saw in the movie as well. Here, do you see my mouse? Here. Yes, we do. Here, okay, here you have the endothelium, you have bio ADN, you have the uh, uh, bioactive medulla, uh, that is present uh, here inside the lumen and that is uh, preserved in this vascular. However, there is also a bio adrenomedulin in the extra vascular space. And this is uh, interact with the smooth muscle cells and using a vasodilation if there is an, uh, an excess. Then basically, if there is no excess of white APM in the uh, extravascular APM, there is no vasodilation. And on the other hand, if you have a lot of bioAPM, this helps to store it at the vascular body. We explained it. Uh, and the last part of the mechanism in this review uh, with a team of uh, teacher, uh, teachers. Two, uh, the program has two uh, studies. As first, the phase of the clinical study that was done in healthy volunteers. And to go quickly and briefly, it showed favorable safety profile in healthy uh, volunteers and subject got polysaccharide and cystic uh, inflammation and uh, the study met all the primary and secondary men. Now I'm going to show you a genus 2 trial and uh, again uh, you will see the preliminary uh, headline results but as I told you earlier it is fit with the initial hypothesis. And the idea again is to biomarker therapy years as you know have trials one after the other one that uh, had a neutral effect in uh, sepsis and we felt all of us uh, sponsors but also investigators that we need to try to be as close as possible to the pathophysiology of sepsis and so to use on the feet as PR uh, that may uh, harm Patients and may explain septic shock and is to restore this organ that may be something. And basically, when a patient has a shock of the failure of the now, we would measure bioidm assay, and only if the bioidm level would exceed a certain level, and this is what we name in trials enrichment, predictive enrichment, this means we enrich the population of with those who have very high chance to be successful when they get therapy and this, and this predictive enrichment is not only select the patient with a high bioidm that will be uh, the patients get target therapy and this is at the Suximab uh, body that modulate bioidm uh, concentration and the idea here is to see Operation of endothelial pump. The trial was already uh, the trial was already uh, shown uh, uh, and described. Do you hear me better here? Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Then the trial was, was described in, uh, recently. The primary objective was safety and tolerability of the antibody of the Suximab, and here. Please pay attention on two important points that are rarely done in all these septic shock trials. First, 
with Pierre Francois Laferre, we felt that we should really um, treat the patient and investigate the patient who are in the very early phase of sex and of septic shock. Why? Because that we know that the longer we wait to, to give a treatment, the more there will be organ dysfunction and we will enter in, in an irreversible phase of organ dysfunction. And very important here, it's early septic shock, very early within 12 hours of administration of norepinephrine. And the other very important inclusion criteria was elevated by your ADM and based on the uh, data from uh, biobanks and cohorts we had, uh, we decided to put the threshold at 70 picogram per milliliter over, uh, and then the idea is to investigate safety and tolerability over the 70. There were other secondary endpoints. First is uh, efficacy uh, data in those patients with early septic shock and uh, also some PK uh, PD. If we now look more uh, carefully on the design, first it's a European multi-center. Germany did uh, very well in this study, uh, and we have also Netherlands, uh, France, and Belgium. Then the trial design was the following. Patients uh, was admitted for septic shock, indeed, with to, to inject the drug within 12 hours, then we had to uh, already uh, uh, test the patient and check whether the patient is in septic shock within the initial hours. And really, we took the patient in the initial phase of septic shock. We quickly uh, measured bio-ATM locally. Uh, then this was done in the biochemical lab of each center. For power solution, we had one core lab with uh, uh, 10, almost 10 ICUs in the Paris region. And uh, when the uh, bio-ADM level was higher than 70 picogram per milliliter, uh, we checked for eligibility and we randomized the patient. For you, just uh, I think it's important for trialists to mention that close to 20%, which is more than 20% of the patients, where the clinician said, this is a septic shock for sure, no problem, we measured bio-ADM and it was below 70 picogram per milliliter. And it made sense to enrich those septic shock patients with a high bioradium level. Patients were randomized with three arms. One arm, 150 patients, was placebo arm, and the two other arms were treated. One uh, arm, 75 patients, uh, was adrisuximab 2 mg per kilo. This was injected on a bolus dose, and the other 75 patients had adrisuximab at 4 mg per kilo. We mostly uh, are going to show you the efficacy results combining the two, uh, the two arms, the two treated arms. Okay, then uh, let's again look whether uh, we succeeded to have comparable groups. Uh, what are we going to compare? What I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you the uh, baseline data among the, uh, for the three groups. Uh, again, placebo, adrisuximab 2 mg per kilo, and adrisuximab 4 mg per kilo, and you will uh, see that uh, when we would compare demographic characteristics, uh, age, gender, or weight, uh, when we uh, have made comparison of vital signs, prenatal pressure, temperature, uh, biomarkers, PCT, and the bioadrenomedulin level, the plasma circulating bioadrenomedulin level, SOFA score for the origin of the sepsis, and you, need, you know that this is important because the origin of the sepsis may have a different uh, morbidity and a different safety uh, profile. Then, okay, let me try to here to the slide. I'm sure I see. Okay, here is the slide. What you can see here, uh, here are the comparison, and we are showing you age, temperature, and mean uh, arterial pressure. And you can see first that uh, the age fits with the uh, trials that were already uh, published in uh, septic shock, maybe a little bit older than expected, usually it's 65, 66, you see here, but we are probably closer from 68 to uh, 70. Uh, but in any case, as you can see here, uh, the three arms were comparable for age, comparable for temperature, 
and compare work for mean natural pressure. I should remind you that this is the mean natural pressure before administering the drug that this the patient were already under uh, roughly 10 to 11 hours already of uh, norepinephrine. Okay, now if we look on comparability of uh, biomarkers, procalcitonin here, bioadrenal methylene level, you remember that the patient could be included only if the bioadm was higher than 70, and by the way, it's already interesting to note that when the sponsor uh, confirmed the bioadm level by measuring bioadm in Henningsdorf, uh, close to Berlin, I found uh, exactly the same by the level than the uh, level that was measured by the investigators in their own site. Here is the DPP3, the uh, marker that we just heard about, the marker of necrosis, of cell necrosis. And here is penalkipaline, penkip, that is a marker of kidney uh, function. And uh, as you may know, there is a strong relationship between penkip and glomerular, glomerular filtration. Here again, comparing the three groups, you see no difference in DCT. You see that DCT is high, by the way. Uh, no difference in the bioIDM, as I told you, all the patients have more than 70. DVP3 similar, and pen kit was uh, also uh, similar. Okay, let's now uh, enter in the uh, top of the subject. Uh, the top line below, I will show you first the safety. Here, uh, on the safety, I will show you the treatment emergent uh, adverse events. Uh, and as you can see here, there is a favorable safety profile. Here are the treatment emergent adverse events leading to death. You can see here the serious event, and here you see the event that are uh, related to the therapies. Uh, here you have the placebo arm, you have two and four milligrams per kilo, and you can uh, see that uh, there is no difference uh, among the three subgroups. Although you can already start to see that uh, atrezuximab uh, has some interesting uh, effect compared to the placebo. Then, basically, when you look at safety, without going to uh, and, and going in a minute to uh, efficacy, but looking on safety, there is no difference in the series. Uh, event uh, and even the event uh, related to uh, the treatment. Okay, let's look now on the efficacy. I think for all of us, intensive is, uh, especially by the way, in this uh, uh, period with uh, COVID, what is important for all of us is the uh, mortality. And uh, what you uh, are going to see here is the mortality at 14 days and 28 days. Here, the Blue, dark blue is the placebo arm, and in the light blue is the adrezuximab. The two arms uh, were combined. Then, basically, uh, here it's 150 patients, and the blue arm, uh, light blue arm, the combined treatment is also 150 patients. And on the y axis, you have a relative uh, mortality. And I think you can see here that there is uh, a clear trend or a reduction in uh, mortality, both at 14 days and 28 days. And again, here we combine the two arms, uh, Nitos and Hardos, and clearly there is an effect on early death uh, that was sustained, uh, by the way, up to 90 days uh, after administration of, uh, of the drug. Then this uh, lead uh, the whole group, the sponsors, but also the steering committee, to think that indeed when we have infection, there is biomarkers on inflammation and we have a systemic inflammation. That's very likely what is happening in septic shock, and very likely in the early phase already of septic shock, is not only we have uh, in, inside the plasma, we have markers of inflammation, but on the CDL cells, is, by the way, the first barrier on those biomarkers that are circulating. We have very likely, very early, and maybe uh, uh, already uh, hours after, before vascular dysfunction, we have already endothelial dysfunction. Then very likely endothelial dysfunction is appearing very early, and again, probably 
probably much earlier than the hypertension and vascular dysfunction. The, when we measured bio-IDM, we saw that we found a very high level of bio-IDM, and this suggests a loss of endothelial dysfunction, vascular leakage, and then the patient will enter in the uh, vicious cycle, and at the end, it will lose organ dysfunction. But it is also interesting to mention, and I will show you later in a minute, is again, keep in mind that we, that those, we tested those patients very early in their uh, septic septic shock, you can see that not only we had a loss of endothelial function, but we had a cell death. And uh, Karine Bourgeois earlier uh, told you about DPP3. Uh, as you may have seen earlier, we saw an increase in DPP3, and uh, we published uh, uh, in cardiogenic shock a negative effect of DPP3 in heart function, and I can also tell you that this is also true for uh, septic shock. And very likely, the patient would die not only because of vascular leakage, but also because of direct effect, very likely direct effect of DPP. Now, how can we convince you? And we heard, I heard the question earlier of uh, someone in the room saying that uh, is DPP3 uh, really a marker? Uh, what we can tell you here is indeed in septic shock, we have, let's say, three categories. We have a category of a light septic shock, of a regular septic shock, of patients with a very severe septic shock with a, uh, who may die with a high risk. And, and very likely those patients are the patients with a very high cell necrosis with a, uh, with a very high DPP3. Now interestingly, if we exclude those patients who have a very high chance to die with a very high DPP3, you see that the difference in relative mortality between placebo arm and treated arm is uh, more striking and again, this is true at 14 days, 28 days, uh, and also at night. And again, I'm really honored to uh, present this data for the first time to all of you guys, and it's really uh, on behalf of the steering committee that was uh, passionate by this trial, and essentially when we saw the, uh, the initial results, and we can say that this clinical phase 2 biomarker guided trial, again, in the early septic shock, we clearly could show that there is a very, very safety, a favorable safety profile, I think there is uh, evidence that Amarisizumab uh, uh, really can help our patients, and uh, I hope uh, I convince you that there is a, a clear positive trend in survival. And I think I know the literature sir, since uh, more than 30 years I'm doing trials in septic shock, and I think it's the first time that we see some hopes. Indeed, it's phase two, it has to be confirmed phase three, but clearly it's a promising drug in our case. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for this um, clear talk and uh, the presentation of these uh, clearly novel data. Um, you, you showed the relative mortality of uh, minus uh, 30 percent and I think this, this uh, means a total uh, mortality um, uh, reduction of about 8 percent if I got it right. Um, do you have any clue whether this is more due to the stabilization of uh, the endothelial barrier function uh, or more due to a reduction of vasodilation? Yeah, uh, it's, a very, it's a very important point. We are analyzing right now all this. And in fact, the, probably the two goes together because uh, we are looking not only, for example, on the need of vasopressor, which can give a, a good indication of vascular dysfunction, but looking on endothelial dysfunction, we looked on the need of fluids, and we looked on, especially on fluid balance. Now again, it's confidential because we're analyzing and we are preparing the paper, but I can tell you that there is a relationship between uh, mortality, treatment, and, and fluid balance. And, and I think we all agree that fluid balance is really uh, good, I mean, one of the parameters that is accepted as a good balance, as, as a good index of endothelial uh, dysfunction. What about the use of uh, catecholamines? Uh, do you already know whether there was a difference between the two groups? No, I don't know whether there are differences in the, between the two groups, because again, there are uh, analyzing uh, this, 
But what I can uh, already tell you is that we, we are looking really in, in several markers, like change in SOFA score, uh, SOFA score, and there are really promising, uh, promising uh, trends there uh, to show that uh, Adreno Middle is really doing something interesting. And what I didn't show you again, because I think we would like to leave it for the paper, is whether there is a dose-dependent effect. Uh, I think maybe the safety you saw that maybe there is a dose-dependent effect that the whole adrenal medulli uh, arm, the two arms, uh, clearly show some effect. But in addition, there is a, uh, yeah, like a uh, dose-dependent effect, which is really very exciting. I want to also congratulate you to these interesting results, really. Uh, which clearly show an effect of uh, the antibody in uh, the settings. I was wondering if, if you can explain to us a little bit more about the proposed mechanism of action. Um, you mentioned, and the previous talk mentioned, that uh, there is a translocation of the bioactive adrenomedulin from the extravascular to the intravascular space, which is achieved. How is this supposed to happen? Yeah. In, in fact, uh, the antibody, let me, let me go back to, to the slide and, and we can explain it probably easier for you to get it. Uh, the adrenal, bioadrenal medulin, when it is outside the vessel, is going to uh, act on smooth vessel cells and create vasodilators. And we know that several papers showing that bioadrenomedulin inside the lumen of the vessels act directly on the uh, vascular uh, vascular part of the epithelial cells and help uh, increase in vascular uh, infinity. The antibody is going to stick to one portion of bioADN and then it's going to aspirate by, by sticking to the bioADN bio in the plasma it's going to aspirate by osmosis and, and active mechanism is going to aspirate bioADN that is outside the cell, inside the, the lumen. And the idea is to aspirate as much as we can bioADN from outside to inside the lumen to try to uh, limit the negative effect that is outside the vessels and gain the benefits uh, of bioADN inside the vessels. It's like a transition from outside to inside uh, the cell. And there are data to show that we really could see on the cereal cells uh, sticking more one uh, to the other one by the end. Yeah, no, I, I totally believe the biological. Pardon? There was no sound for your case. Okay. I, I fully believe the biological effect that you see. Uh, that's, I mean, the effect on mortality is very clear and significant. but. There, there is no, the, the mechanism that is proposed doesn't work for me. I mean, uh, from a physiological perspective, you can't sort of reabsorb a biomolecule from the extravascular into the intravascular space simply by adding an antibody on one side, or it would take an extremely long time. What probably happens is that you capture the bio adreno, bioactive adrenomedulin that is intravascular and prevent it from going outside because now you couple it to a large molecule like the antibody and that may suffice then to reduce the extravascular uh, uh, concentration but uh, that's probably more a question of pathomechanisms than of real uh, therapeutic effectiveness which again uh, I think your data very clearly documents. We have a few questions from the audience um, the first one is, uh, how many doses are necessary to treat septic shock? shock? Is it a continuous administration necessary? It's a very, very good question. And uh, as you know, uh, this is one of the first times in a critical care area where we are using antibodies. Uh, I think we, many of us who tested this uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago with other biomarkers. And usually an antibody has a long half-life. And today,
today is here in this protocol. We injected both those, it was doing for a few minutes, and the idea is that uh, the effect is prolonged for hours, for several hours, or maybe more than that. Uh, we did not analyze the pharmacokinetics, then this is, uh, will be done in the next weeks, and we will do exactly uh, what we are doing by measuring first up the map and also by UAM and try to link the two. That, that we will know very quickly what, uh, what we did in that. Okay, um, so I think we have to stop at this point because we're already running late and I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Mezaba, uh, once again and uh, we uh, should move on in the program. Thank you thank again. You. Uh, thank you. And we come to our next presentation, which is by Professor Riedemann from Jena, and he will tell us about potential benefits of blocking the complement factor C5A in COVID-19 infections and sepsis. Please. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure being here. Um, uh, brings me back to former times when I was really heavily involved in sepsis research and I want to start this off with something that I usually never do. I want to say hi to my four kids and my wife and the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm traveling the world, I have been traveling the world, I work very hard on the topic sepsis as some of uh, the people in this room know and I think uh, we sometimes for, forget the collateral damage and since I'm going to come back to the collateral damage, one of the collateral damages that accounts for all of us that put their time and efforts in this is that sometimes our families don't see us enough and in those times like we have right now we may uh, be reminded of that so let's let's jump into this um, I've been um, involved in this as I mentioned before so I've been in my past position working in intensive care I had the honor of leading the intensive care unit of Professor Conrad Reinhardt who organized this meeting today and uh, uh, I much enjoyed working there uh, with, with this great person as my boss. And um, uh, at that time, we had uh, the, the, the uh, I would say, we, we wanted to go into the endeavor to, to try to conquer the treatment in sepsis. And I know how difficult it is, so I, I have the highest respect for people who work in this. And we have never really given up. And just so happens that today, as I am you know, also founder and CEO of this company, Inflarex, uh, I, I have a conflict of interest to declare, which I hereby do, uh, that, that I come back to this topic through this very COVID-19 epidemic that is right now holding all of us um, uh, up at night and, and so on and so forth. So um, I want to talk about the role of complement C5A in, in sepsis, but really also in COVID-19. And I'll tell you uh, in a bit why I also took on the, the, the quest to, to give this lecture today. So uh, just very briefly, this is the kind of slides that nobody wants to, to look at, but I think in this case, please look at it with me for a few seconds. So in our blood, we have these complement pathways, uh, the classical lectin alternative pathway, and, and they can be activated through different factors. And just so happens that SARS co co uh, coronavirus 2 seems to be engaged in this as well, at least for SARS viruses, that's been shown that the lectin pathway seems to play a certain role. And then there's other ways, and in the end, the complement system is nothing but an alarming system that when the terminal pathway C5 is cleaved, we can react to invading microorganisms such as viruses. And C5A is really one of the key factors here. It's cleaved off the mother molecule C5, and it's a very strong amplifier of inflammation. It works through two receptors. It has a pro-inflammatory effect through, two, through, the, through both of the receptors. And why is this meaningful in the context of sepsis or in the context of uh, uh, COVID-19? Now, I think this is the answer, so I can shorten the talk and stop it right here. No. The uh, C5A is one of the, if not the strongest activator of neutrophils. So what you have here is from my, uh, my former boss, Professor Peter Ward at the University of Michigan, where the two founders of Inflarex started out. Uh, this is a electron -microsco uh, mi uh, microscopy, electron -microsco uh, microscopy of neutrophils here, and you see that the upper row, these neutrophils are not very much uh, excited. These, this is how resting neutrophils look. And then, just low amounts of C5A, you see what happens. They start bubbling, they start uh, releasing granular enzymes, and they create reactive oxygen species through O2 radical formation. 
And while this is an effective weapon, it's also a dirty bomb because it kills tissue wherever it's released. And this is the fact that I strongly believe that in neutrophil-driven lung damage, in lung injury, especially in pneumonia and in viral lung injury, this is why our lungs get chewed up because mechanisms such as neutrophil activation play a key role in the, in the induced damage. So um, I, I believe this is a non-addressed medical need in, in clinical science, and I think it's very meaningful in the disease. This is a picture that we drew like some years ago, but I think it's still valid. So this is supposed to be a vessel here with a tissue around, and in the vessel you see all sorts, uh, all sorts of cells, granulocytes floating around, but really when CFAVA is produced, and I mentioned it can be produced through the complement pathways and, and other ways, um, there's a lot of receptors. Neutrophil, one neutrophil has 200,000 binding sites for C5A, and they get, in, get strongly activated, and they recruit, they chemo-attract neutrophils from the vessel into the tissue, and again, that's where they start making O2 radicals and release enzymes. So as a byproduct of this engagement, tissue injury is induced, and tissue injury leads to organ dysfunction and eventually to organ damage. Now you see that also coagulation is very much involved, and that I will loop that back to COVID-19 in a few minutes. So the tissue factor, the extrinsic uh, pathway of the coagulation system is strongly initiated when C5A engages with the C5A receptor and endothelial cells. So coagulation pathway is kicked on. Okay, so let's, let's look at that mechanism and let's just briefly reflect on what we have done back then in sepsis. We strongly believe back then, and this is a, this is a picture modified after the famous picture of, of, uh, of um, Hotchkiss, real Richard Hotchkiss, great guy in the field. And uh, he, uh, you know, he had a more simple version of this, and we tried to develop that a little bit further, and we strongly believe that there is a corridor for an anti-inflammatory treatment, which is early in sepsis. And I do believe that we were the first company in the world that really recruited patients in the first few hours after onset of organ dysfunction. Uh, was a slow enrollment, <laughs> but I have to say it was worth it because we learned something. Now, historically, however, the trials usually included patients with sepsis, and that's really not a disease. It's, it's a reaction that happens in all types of different inflammatory diseases. Um, they recruited patients really after that pro-inflammatory phase, really more when there were anti-inflammatory sickness kicking in. And then again, you know, each patient is different, and immunosuppressed patients, as we know, they may not even show any pro-inflammatory response. So the question is, if you want to block a cytokine that is not there, how much effect can you believe you will have? So, um, so you know, we use this technology that the company that I co-founded developed, which is called IFX1. It's an antibody that specifically sees, binds, and um, eliminates the free C5A after it's cleaved off the mother molecule and it can really block the biological effects to 100% and it leaves the other part of the immune system, C5B, intact. That is important in the context of sepsis because C5B, when it engages with the other terminal complement molecules, forms the so-called membrane attack complex and that induces lysis, for example, in invading um, bacteria. So you don't really want to block this when you go into complement and sepsis. Now this was the sh small trial back then. We ran 76 screen patients for failure, 72 patients randomized. We had a placebo group, two to one randomized to all these groups, and then a low dose, medium, and high dose group. And the enrollment time was, was very, very long, even though we, we did that with a network here in Germany. The main uh, criteria for inclusion were like abdominal and pulmonary infections only, and at least one organ dysfunction due to sepsis and the occurrence would have had to be within three hours for cardiovascular, but 12 hours for other organ dysfunction. So a very stringent protocol, and we had to administer the drug within three and a half hours after onset. Now, um, you know, we had certain exclusion criteria as is usual, but um, I'm not gonna go into this into too much detail. These were the three dose groups, the low dose two times two milligrams per kilogram. That was really a, a very low dose that is not effective enough to control CFA over a durable time point. Uh, maybe just a few hours, so certainly um, more on the low end. But the other two doses, at least for the first 24 hours, patients got two times four milligrams per kilogram, which gives you uh, a certain blockade of C5A, especially here in the, in the higher dose group with the third dose at 72 hours, 
which, uh, which gives you, I would say, five, seven, eight days of, of, of con good control of CFFA in the blood. Um, so we had a little bit of uh, bad luck in this trial because it just so happens in small trials that the placebo group by far was the healthiest group. And uh, against all predictions, we, we had a, a, an extremely low placebo uh, um, um, complication rate and also death rate. And when you look at the baseline characteristics without going into details, you see that the lactate levels were close to normal while in the high dose group, we had much higher lactate levels. This for an intensivist is usually a very good indication that these patients have organ dysfunction. And also these patients in the high dose group were in, 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 in mean here uh, almost 10 years older. So th there were confounding factors and also had more organ dysfunction. So I just wanna mention that, but this was a safety trial. This was not efficacy trial. It was a main focus on safety on the dose escalation. But I wanna share one thing with you this is real data from the placebo group of that trial, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, TNF-alpha, median. Now, this is the trial. Remember, three and a half hours after onset, or three hours after onset of cardiovascular problems, um, you were able to get into the trial. Within three and a half hours, you had to get the dose. So in the first few hours of this trial, IL-6 dropped by, from, from like, by dramatic amounts down to maybe 20% at 24 hours. So if you had recruited this patients, these patients in a trial like we did before, you would have simply missed the window. So I th I, when I saw this, I thought that our theory is right and I was very happy about that. Um, and now we, we saw some signals, I just wanna show you two, like for example, when you look at the first um, hours, that's why I said medium and low, high dose group are the same dosing for, for the first uh, hours here. That's why we put them together. So you saw that there was some tendencies in reducing, for example, IL-8 levels and others faster. And one interesting signal, despite the patients who were most sick, had twice, almost twice as much lactate at the baseline. When you looked at the high dose and uh, the medium dose, the ICU-free days and also other parameters were quite a bit different. I mean, these are a lot of days, right? This is just uh, a difference that, of course, with so many, uh, uh, such a low patient number, not statistically significant. But there were trends, we were very happy. And uh, we met all primary endpoints, highly statistically significant uh, inhibition of C5A, very selective, no MAC formation interaction that was of concern, well tolerated, safe, PKPD profile almost exactly as predicted, no ADAs detected, so we were very happy, uh, except that we could not find anyone to fund further trials in sepsis. Um, and then uh, we said, well, one day I'm gonna come back to it, and, Conrad is, is smiling here in the background. He knows that I'm a stubborn guy like him, so I will come back to this one day, and maybe I will come back through COVID-19, who knows? Now let's talk about that. So back then, um, please tell them I'm not at home right now. <laughs> back then, I, we, we said, let's look into viral lung injury as well. We were very interested in that mechanism, in this neutrophil influx-driven damage. And we just happened back then, there was a breakout of what people believed could be another epidemic, we just had lived through the avian flu, which people like me vividly remember, but this was the second avian flu virus that broke out in China. Now, not many people of you may know that, it, it was called H7 and 9, but back then the Chinese government was extremely worried that it makes, make it, make, uh, could make it global again. And so we got into this program through the main investigator into this high level security, and we treated monkeys here with H7 and 9 and with IFX1. And long story short, you see there's a lot more open air space on the right side. There's a lot less neutrophils in, uh, in, infiltrated. I show that in the next slide. And, um, you know, sorry, clearly, you know, there was an effect and the neutrophil driven lung, dam lung damage was clearly reduced. And this is the, the blinded pathology read here on the lower end. So we were very happy. This is all published. And also neutrophils and macrophage influx here, as you can see in the next page, 15 was greatly reduced. Um, and that was going well along with our mechanism. And then uh, uh, one thing I just wanna mention here, one thing that we also found next to that, which we couldn't fully explain and we still cannot fully explain it, that the viral replication rate was dramatically, statistically significantly reduced. Now we don't believe that's a direct effect. We do believe that may be an indirect effect, but these 
viruses and single-strand RNA, RNA viruses and others do that. They create a massive complement activation in the lung, and they may create an environment that helps them that, to replicate, uh, and that's what we believe happens. But um, this really um, was a starting point for other groups to look at that as well, and, and, and the group here, the same group, a different author, looked at that then with the MERS coronavirus infection, a different model here, a rodent model, and they found the exact same thing. The, the lung pathology was improved. Uh, here, next slide, they, they also looked here at the coronavirus um, staining and, and saw that this is just, there was a dramatic difference going along with what I said earlier. And then, then look at the viral RNA copies. This, this is exactly what we had found before. Uh, I didn't show you that, but just you take my word for it. And so this was very interesting. There was a mechanism that wasn't like uh, exclusive for H7 and 9 or avian flu viruses, but also coronaviruses carry that. Now, another group then in the US uh, carried that forward and they used C3 knockout mice. They wanted to know if they really terminate complement very high level, do they see something? And this is a coronavirus, uh, SARS coronavirus infection model. And these are summarizing some of the interesting uh, parts here. On the left side, you see complement activation in the lung and, you know, in the lethal doses and those animals that died, you saw there was at least at time point statistical significance in the uh, C4B and um, complement factor B, which is a marker for the alternative pathway activation. And then, you know, interesting, hidden in a lot of data, you see that the red here in the middle part, that's, that's the mice that were infected with a high dose and didn't have any protection, and they had significantly more activated CD11C positive neutrophils in the lungs. Now the C3 knockout mice, this is the blue ones, they didn't have that. So that's another trace on the same mechanism. And then on the right side, you saw that the C3 knockout mice, they were protected. They had better airway resistance uh, um, and also mid-breath expiratory flow. So the, this is a whole body plethysmography, which apparently that exists in mice. I, I have not seen it, but it's sophisticated. So I hope it's meaningful, but um, I, I do think it's a very interesting study. Now, what brings us to coronavirus disease? And uh, back to the question why I accepted to, to, to give a, you know, a talk about this aside of my role as leading a company, back to my role of having been a scientist. And I still believe I am one, but sometimes it feels different. Um, and um, the reason why we want to talk a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about this, is because our technology, uh, the C5A antibody technology that we discovered, developed, created, patent protected, uh, we have out-licensed out that uh, to a Chinese partner that we worked from day one on certain aspects with. And they're, they're developing that, that antibody, which we call IFX1 under BDB1, in China as we speak in COVID-19 infected patients. And so we hope that we get um, uh, more results soon. Uh, but we are very, very um, hopeful that you know, because of the mechanisms we studied so well, that there, there, there could be a chance to treat the more severely affected patients. And I want to go into that with you. So COVID-19, I think you, we all know it's SARS-CoV-2. It's, it's, it probably uses the AC2 receptor to, to entry the cell. Um, and it was first identified, this new one in Wuhan, um, in, in December 2019. Now, clinically, this is an interesting virus. It has a very long latency. Uh, incubation time prior to symptoms is estimated between 2 to 14 days, but an average at least 7 to 9 days, I guess. And uh, symptoms are flu-like symptoms, fevers, signs of lower respiratory tract, and especially cough, dry cough, and, and also throat ache. But interestingly, typically not running nose is not usually a typical sign for that. Slow disease onset, that's typical. Um, death is typically caused by respiratory failure uh, in the presence of sepsis. I'm going to come back to that, and that loops us back to our topic here, and multi-organ dysfunction. Uh, risk factors, you know, some of them are in, in the public already, like age, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, COPD, immunodeficiency, and others. And um, I want to go to a, a few publications today, and this is one that I would like to uh, flag specifically from a Chinese group here running the largest trials. Pr uh, the, the principal investigator, I think, is, I believe his, uh, his name is Chao Bin. Uh, and this is an excellent paper in Lancet, uh, Infectious Diseases. And, you know, one thing that, that peeks out here is really that 
the non-survivors, this was 55, 54 patients versus 137 survivors in, in, this, in this court that they published, they had 100% diagnosis of sepsis. And you see that 98% really has re re had respiratory failure, but interestingly also an ARDS, uh, also high number of ARDS patients. That means uh, an oxygenation index below 100, really. So um, obviously the lung is the primary organ, but you see specifically in this disease, and I go back to that, there's also heart failure rates and there's also liver disease in others. So this is very interesting. Um, and I just want to point out to the right, next to the risk factors I mentioned, leukocytosis is very typical and it's associated with death, specifically neutrophils. And D-dimers over one, showing you a like signs for coagulopathy, and this is, this is, uh, this is highly correlated with, with, the, with the likelihood of dying. And so I, I do believe that brings us back to the trace. And this is probably one of the best charts I've found so far in the literature. This is, this is how they looked at the mean uh, uh, survivors versus non-survivors. And you see in both, like around day nine, day 10, they have patients with diagnosis of sepsis. Again, in the non-survivors, it's 100%. So it takes nine to 10 days before they kind of deteriorate. And you see that dyspnea is something that happens before. Now, ICU admission, that may have to do with the country that may be earlier in our countries or later in others, but you see that um, the, the onset here of, of invasive ventilation is supposed to be, and that's also what I heard from the Chinese folks that we've been talking to, it's kind of a death sentence. When they put you on a ventilator, they see 70, 70% dying. That's what I heard, you know, maybe they're different numbers, but it could have to do with the fact that they're inducing ventilation very late in the game. I don't think that we would do that. I could see myself yelling at a, at a young intensivist if he hadn't intubated someone that was distressed in this, to this extent. But um, it gives us a very interesting peek into how these patients um, develop. And I think it's a meaningful number, and other publications already confirmed that. So let's look at the laboratory findings. So very interesting, lymphopenia. Lymphocytopenia in blood, um, elevated CRP. Now, that's not too surprising. Uh, neutrophil counts are positively correlated. I, I mentioned that with bad outcome. Uh, and the pro 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 potential prognostic biomarker could be the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So a patient with more neutrophils and less lymphocytes has, a, has the worst outcome. And uh, mild levels of, of cytokines, especially at the beginning of the Th1 response, I come back to that in a second, and um, other frequently markers I mentioned, D-dimers, and then also liver enzymes, et cetera, and acute phase proteins. So the diagnosis and uh, the pathological events, I think, is something that we should look at as well. Severe COVID-19 deficient, you have to have one, at least, of those symptoms. Shortness of breath with a breathing rate over 30, oxygen saturation um, at resting state lower than 93%, and a uh, oxygenation index here of smaller than 300 millimeters uh, Hg. C CT findings really classically bilateral, but also sometimes monolateral uh, ground glass opacities. Pathology in lung, infiltration of monocytes, lymphocytes, uh, they have a thrombi, focal pulmonary hemorrhage, necrosis, so real tissue damage, and interstitial fibrosis. It's interesting, so that's really happening in severe damaging lung events. And then in the heart, you see even inter interstitial infiltrations of monocytes, lymphocytes, and neutrophils, and the same thing in, in liver. So this, there is something that happens in these organs, and specifically the heart has been pointed out by investigators that this is involved in this disease. Now, you don't hear that much about kidney problems in this, which typically next to cardiovascular events is usually what we intensivists see most of the time, right? So that's interesting. So let's look at a few things here, white blood cell counts and neutrophils. And again, this is a different publication from a different group, one here and, uh, and, and also another one from Gong. And you see that the non-survivors versus survi survivors have not only a very different white blood cell count, but this white blood cell count is very much driven by the neutrophils. So again, our breadcrumbs here, the neutrophils maybe play a, a role in it. I mean, it, it could be just a correlation or it could be a causative relation. We don't know yet. But it's been something that is significantly found, and you see that the, the more critical ill patient you are, the more likely it is that you see this elevation. So um, 
summarizing this on a very high level, not too scientifically here, but what we see, this, this is again like a, like, a, like a picture here, tissue, you see the blood vessel. So in the initiation, you have a type one type interferon signaling response, which is very common to also not so severe grade inflammations. And uh, you have local inflammation and you start very early with lymphocytopenia, interestingly. And you find those lymphocytes in the lung, by the way. You know where they're going, they're not gone. In the resolution phase, you recover this, you go back to normal lymph counts and you have uh, the inflammation under control. But if you deteriorate, you see lymphocyte suppression continues, you see neutrophil getting activated, getting in there and strong inflammation, cytokines, organ damage, coagulopathy. We believe CFA could play a role, um, and we will know soon more about it. Um, and here are some facts again on the right side that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so our conclusions, COVID-19 is a disease present, presented with viral inflammation, immune-mediated injury, neutrophil-mediated tissue damage, and lymphopenia, lymphocytopenia-induced immune incompetence could be two essential pathogenic events. Respiratory failure, Viral sepsis and multi-organ dysfunction are known deadly events here, and we believe there could be a potential uh, to treat the immune-mediated injury here, so the more severe cases with a, with a blockade of C5A. Now, last slide here. What I'm, and I'm now making a little bit more of a political statement, what I'm really missing right now in Germany, but also in many European countries, and I just saw today that there's something on the European, uh, websites that, 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 that there's more of a combined effort to evaluate approaches. But until maybe this weekend, I did not find anything where we believe that we can tackle this. We all know that there's a lot of vaccines right now produced from RNA vaccines to other vaccines. And I, I very much hope this will be successful. And I'm, I'm sure these companies will succeed, but it will take time, maybe a year or more. And so, I believe right now the fear drives a lot of damage. It drives direct damage. It drives collateral damage, right? Because we have, we're running short of resources. We're stopping certain operations that then you know, have to find their way into the healthcare system later. Uh, and we have a global economic damage and crisis. So I do think we should be trusting our own research enough to say maybe we can do something. Because if we can treat the severely affected patients, I don't think people would run around in the same fear anymore. So I'm missing really approaches that go to these patients, to the severe ones. And if we find something there, whatever that may be, we can save lives, we can help patients recover more rapidly and, and thus you know, not transition to the worst complete lung failure, and we may save ICU capacities and thereby reducing the collateral damage. With that, I'm, I'm thankful that I was invited and that I could speak as a scientist once again. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Professor Riedemann, for this presentation. Um, I think my co-moderator, Professor Lipton Raab, took the first question. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Very kind. <laughs> you said so you maybe, maybe, maybe a quick remark and a question. Um, so you showed us very convincing data um, on positive results from the animal models of different kinds of pneumonia. On the other hand, not that clearly therapeutic efficacy in sepsis in humans. And um, uh, so uh, maybe this is not just a disconnect between animals and humans, but maybe this is a question of timing. So maybe it makes sense to go in early before, let's say, pneumonia has developed into uh, ARDS and into sepsis. And now when we think about COVID-19, uh, this might be a, like a model disease because people are feeling sick and then several days later they develop pneumonia and several days again later they develop ARDS and maybe sepsis if they do so. Um, so maybe it would make sense, and this is more a comment or a, even a question, uh, it would make sense now to not focus again on the most severely sick, but maybe on those who have not yet developed ARDS and sepsis. Yeah, those, those were a lot of points, I think all valid. Um, 
except that I think that we had some interesting signals early in the sepsis trials. And, but the one thing that I learned about this is the patient in, in homogeneity that really kills you in sepsis trials. Because, you know, you, we, we've talked about the, 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 the sepsis attributable death rate. That means how many of those that die actually die because of sepsis or because of other things like they have, you know, to say it bluntly, a hole in the gut that we surgeons cannot stitch together anymore, and this happens every day. So to think that we can just treat them as one group is very courageous, and I think you see, we've seen trials today where people make efforts to you know, find a patient population that may have a benefit, and that's certainly a good approach. Now I think what's very interesting about also your comment is that in this disease, we see something like uh, almost like a model of how you can progress into a situation where you get more severe and severe sick. So there's a lot of time window to treat when you get severely sick before you reach full-blown ARDS. Now those of us that, that remember avian flu, you saw the patient on the ICU next day, he was in full-blown ARDS. This is not what we see here. So I think there is actually a very interesting window of treatment. And we all know that when you have a complete damage and you're hoping for repair, that such a mechanism may not be as effective anymore. So I, I think it's, it's a very valid comment. I think we need to find sick, severe sick patients. I don't think you can take biologic uh, into everyone who has some slight symptoms. But if you start having severe shortness of breath and you're going into the hospital and you're, you're feeling bad and you, you see that in your parameters that your oxygenation drops, that's a time you could also start treatment. Okay. So I, you know, to your point, I think very well taken. Thank you. Um, maybe if I may, just a quick uh, second question. Um, as you know, I really very much like the concept of blocking C5A. We've been working on that as well. Um, but um, the question would be, uh, I mean, there's ecolizumab on the market, uh, which sort of blocks uh, the terminal activation of the complement system. What's, what's the advantage from your point of view of uh, C5A blocking? Okay. One thing is that the, the, the yearly treatment doesn't cost $600,000 yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, this is a, like, ecolizumab is a, is, a, is a very well working antibody blocking the complement driven C5P, which we have published and shown that there, there is also C5A activation from sources like enzymes, right? They can cleave directly C5 and cleave off C5A, and eculizumab cannot prevent that. Okay. When I first said it, people really thought that I'm crazy until we could prove it. And so there is, that's one thing to your question, there are sources of generating C5A that are outside the reach of eculizumab. How much role does that play in this disease? I think it may well be in the tissue. So that could one thing that speaks for it. Would you be able to treat patients which with complement derived diseases with eculizumab? Yes, I believe so too. Yeah. So I would not discard the, the fact that you could treat patients with that. When it, when when the mechanism is, as we believe, very focused on neutrophil driven damage, I do think that you have a much better potency with a drug like ours. Because remember the signal is so abundant. Every neutrophil is filled with these antenna C A receptors. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, I feel much more positive about taking a targeted approach. But I would not exclude that you could reach also effects with higher up there blockade. That's, as a compliment scientist, I have to tell the truth. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was very much interested in the effects of your C5A neutralization strategy on the viral titers which, yeah. as you mentioned, were not really to be expected. And you said it's probably not a direct effect, yeah. but rather an indirect effect due to the inflammatory environment favoring the viral replication somehow. So do you think this is specific for C5A antagonization? Or could other immunomodulatory drugs also have such a reducing effect on viral type? I think you know if you if you hypothesize that it's uh, the the microenvironment created, then yes, you could well imagine that other other drugs that could change that microenvironment from an anti, from a very inflammatory to a less inflammatory could have such an effect. So from a mechanism, I would definitely think it's it's possible. And um, you know, I uh, I do think there's something 
specifically interesting about complement activation in these viruses. I mean, I talk about these breadcrumbs once in a while. When we had the Ebola crisis, I, that was the first time I had flashbacks you know, because of the mechanism. And you find strange little publications. That was, a, for example, a Russian group that showed in, 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 I think, hamsters where they induced Ebola that 36 hours before they died, they consumed the entire C5 pool, so they cleaved it. Every animal. It was a small study in a, in a very unheard of little journal. And, you know, there are these breadcrumbs. So these, like the, the, there are viruses that have a massive induction of complement activation. And it has to do, and it will create a very inflammatory environment. And, you know, I mentioned SARS, uh, sorry, avian flu earlier, where we see that within 24, 36 hours, very short window to treat. But here, we see that you have a stretch over several, maybe five, six, seven days by the time the patient starts feeling really sick until he gets into full blown lung failure. So I think this is an ideal situation to test hypotheses like this. Thank you very much. I think for the sake of time, we have to move on. And uh, it is now my pleasure to announce uh, Felix Balzer, who is a professor uh, here at the Charité. Um, and he is going to tell us about the potential of artificial intelligence and digitalization in diagnosing and managing sepsis. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I'm very delighted to give a presentation on the uh, potential of artificial intelligence and how it may help us with digitalization and the diagnosing and the managing of sepsis. So um, before I would really like to start my presentation, I would like to ask this question, why artificial intelligence is a good idea? And the easy answer is because of the complexity and the amount of data that we already have. So with the ongoing um, attempts and um, procedures to, to uh, of digitalization, both in research and in patient care, there's an enormous amount of data that will even rise in the, uh, in the future. And when I'm talking about data, I mean all sorts of data. I mean structured data, unstructured data. We are talking about omics, um, pictures, radiology graphs, and so forth. And this data can no longer be um, used beyond data silos with the uh, method that we currently have available today. And this is what creates a knowledge gap. But it's not only the amount and the complexity of data that has been changing in the past years, it's also the uh, computer, computing power that is today available to us. I mean, think how it was back then. It was not, it was not like a test of the, uh, of the central IT structure of the hospital. Every uh, department maybe employed some sort of a server technology. And now what we have is the virtual server parks that may be used in a very efficient way and um, algorithms can become available ready to use in the clinics. And also the availability of methods that has really made significant progress over the past years. So it's been those three things that have enabled us to really think about artificial intelligence as a very good potential for sepsis diagnosis and management. Well. Before I talk specifically, more specifically about sepsis, I would like to give you a uh, broad definition of what big data is, and this is what we need for artificial intelligence. So whenever you need machine learning, you need to have data that you can learn from. So you need a high volume of data. So one of those Vs is one of the definitions for big data. So volume, we're talking no longer about megabyte or gigabytes, we're talking about petabytes. For example, here at Charity Hospital, we are talking about four petabytes of data that we have at our IT structure. Secondly, the second B is the variety of data. So as I said, it's a multitude of data. It's not only structured data, structured data. It's really everything that is part of a personal health and that is being reported in uh, those server systems. And third uh, V of this definition is the velocity. So it's the speed by which we can see an increase in data that is available to us. Now, 
why is artificial intelligence a good idea? Let's talk about what we mean by machine learning. And actually, machine learning can, can come down, you can break it down to three different parts. And the first one is called supervised learning. So what is supervised learning? This means that you need to have data that is labeled. You need to have annotated data, so you have data, you know what it means, and you have also, in a machine-readable form, what the outcome means, that it can be computed by a system. Now, the second category is unsupervised learning, and the big difference is here that the data has not to be annotated. No labels are necessary, so you cannot predict a specific outcome, but this may help you to predict or to understand a pattern. So you can maybe see how, per, how certain patients, how certain subjects may share some characteristics, and then in the next step, see what their outcome is. So this is supervised learning, and the third thing is the so-called reinforcement learning. And this is really meant to model and to optimize our sequential decision-making processes that we, have, and that we have in daily clinical routine. Now, which one is the best for uh, artificial intelligence? Which one is the best for sepsis? Of course, you cannot narrow it down to a single one. It all depends on the context and the data that is available. Now, let's get more into the detail of sepsis. Um, when you talk about sepsis prediction models, you can differentiate between those that have a left alignment compared to those who have a right alignment. So let me give you an example. When you're talking about the left alignment, that means um, you have one alignment point that is very specific, so maybe it is the prediction at the time of admission or another time point may be, I don't know, a surgical procedure. So the time point is aligned and then we have a fixed feature window which is being regarded for prediction. And in this example, you can see so every line represents a patient, and the green uh, lines represent patients that do not suffer from sepsis. The red lines are septic patients, and the little flag, the little pinpoint, symbolizes the point of time when the sepsis had its onset. Now, the th um, second thing is the right alignment, and this is much more frequent in our uh, in the literature, and this means that we have a continuous prediction. So we have a window, a feature window, that is actually moving over time, and this has a very big advantage, which is that it is, has a great potential for implementation in daily practice. So first of all, right alignment is great. Right alignment is great because of the potential of real implementation, and secondly, the variety of those algorithm, algorithms is um, is um, not that extensive, so it is much easier to compare them and also to do a systematic review on them. And I picked two of those reviews that I would like to discuss with you um, in my next slides. So one is right here. It is very recently published, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the different lines. I'm just going to focus on the findings from the intensive care unit. So basically, what we have here is you can see the. Uh, diagnostic test accuracy, you can see the area under the curve, and globally what you can say is that the sensitivity of those machine learning algorithms is quite good, the specificity is, well, it's okay, and when you look at the mean um, prediction capacity, you talk about the mean value that is between 70 and 90 percent. Well, on this slide, you can see some very important inherent limitations to this approach. If we talk about learning, if we talk about machine learning, we need to have data available that is being learned from. And there are not that many sources that can be used for learning. The most frequent one, the most uh, well-known one is the MIMIC database. So we have many studies that were uh, conducted in the MIMIC database. So it's the uh, it's an um, open access database in the United States that is uh, available for research. And in the majority of cases, and this is the, uh, the blue bar right in the middle, are databases that are not um, um, openly accessible. So in most cases, it's just the uh, electronic patient record at the hospital. Now, with the first two groups, so the an openly available database or the hospital database, it is possible to evaluate, to assess uh, an algorithm and if the prediction is right or not. But then it comes to outcome. An outcome, this is shown in green right here, is something completely different. So when we want to assess the uh, 
the impact of machine learning on outcome, we need to do a prospective analysis. And right now, there are really not that many studies out there that focus on this very aspect. Now, what are the variables, the parameters used for machine learning? And as you can see, those are not that different um, among studies. So vital signs play the biggest role. Most studies, they included um, variables like heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and so forth. Um, and most of them also included demographic values, lab values were, were uh, fewer ones, but you can see the variety of parameters is not that different. In the studies that were included in this review, um, between two and 49 uh, variables had been, had been used. Now, let's go back to the uh, um, performance of those measures. So here are actually three different lines. I hope that you can see them well here. So you have on the x-axis right here, the hours before the sepsis onset. So if you look at like 12 hours before onset, it's more or less like flipping a coin. It's like 50 or 60%. Now, the best performance was actually achieved by neural networks. This is the uh, dark blue line, which is on the very top. And if you look at maybe three or four hours prior to sepsis onset, you have like an accuracy of, or you have an ROC of 0.7. On the uh, second place, we do have ensemble techniques. So ensemble techniques means that we don't have only one machine learning approach, but a combination of multiple ones. And the last one on the line right here, the green one are decision trees. So, so those are rather simple algorithmic approaches how to solve a clinical question. Now this chart has been taken from another systematic review, which has also very recently been published. And here, what I find very interesting is, you can see a comparison of the machine learning algorithms performances. So this is the first line right here, seven studies included with an ROC of 0.89 to those traditional well-known other systems, like we have the SOFA, we have the QSOFA. So what is the uh, difference we are really talking about? This is what you can see on this slide. So it's like from 0 0.89 to roughly 0 0.7, 0 0.6 um, for the traditional um, approaches. Now, let's, t I just picked um, one particular study that I wanted to emphasize on, and this was also included in the systematic review that I showed you before, which is on the uh, implementation analysis. So here, there was a machine learning algorithm that was not only tested in a retrospective setting, but it was checked how the impact on patient outcome was. And as you can see here, there was a significant increase, a decrease in the length of stay, both in the hospital and at the ICU, as well as a decrease in the uh, in hospital mortality rate. Now, what does digital medicine really look like in our hospitals? And this is maybe what may come to your mind when you think about digital technology, artificial intelligence, but to be honest, the reality um, um, sometimes rather looks like this. So this is the uh, system that we had implemented at our hospital that was just um, updated not too long ago. And to be honest, if this system tells you to give an antibiotic or to do anything else, would you really trust it? And the answer is, I'm not really sure about it. And the other thing is, how does it integrate in your workflow? So how can you be sure that a system integrated in a patient data management system is not um, more of a harm, like popping up when you don't need it, but really a help in terms of your clinical workflow. So um, what I would like to point out in the last part of my talk is the aspect of digitalization. It's not only machine learning, it's also where we get the data from and what we do with the data. So if you look at the timeline right here, patient comes to the doctor's office, later he's admitted to the hospital, after hospital, there's some rehab facility. If you look at the whole entire process, what happens in the hospital is sometimes like a black box. And digitalization may help here to get a better insight of what happens inside this black box. So for example, this is an analysis that we conducted at our 
uh, own database at Charité with the uh, data of 2.5 million patients, roughly 8 million intra-hospital transfers, and you have to read this graph from the left to the right-hand side. So most people came as a general admission. This is on the uh, upper left side. Some came as emergency. Most people um, go when it first to the general ward, and from the general ward, there are all different kinds of transfers possible. So some patients went to the OR, some went to the ICU, from the ICU maybe to another department, until they left the hospital in one of those four conditions that correspond to the values that our controlling department uses. So my message for this slide is, it's not only about the ICU data that we need, it's about broadening the scope, that we need to understand what happens in the hospital and to get engaged into process mining to better understand what we do. And it's not only at the hospital, it's also beyond. So for example here, as in the tele-ICU that we do have in Charité, it's about connecting other hospitals and it's also about connecting after the initial index hospitalization to get a follow-up of patients and to get them connected to the people that treated them. So what do we need to do? What are the next steps for getting machine learning algorithms to work in the ICU? First of all, it's about the validation of algorithms. So as I said, it really depends on where they learn, where they get the data from. And for example, if you have the uh, openly available database, which is served by uh, uh, a number of hospitals, it's really specific to this certain patient population. It does not correspond to other parts of, in the case of MIMIC, the United States, or it does not correspond to maybe other health systems, as for instance, low or middle income countries. The second aspect is, um, you can have the best algorithm without having it implemented in your software, the hospital, it's not gonna do any benefit. And once you have it implemented, it's important to get it tested. Prospective testing before you can actually do an RCT to really see what the benefit in terms of patient-centered outcome is. The uh, author of this uh, review, Mathieu Komorowski, compared this development of algorithms with the development of drugs, which I find actually a very good comparison. So if you start developing a drug, you start with many different specimens, and it takes much time. So during the time of drug discovery and preclinical testing, many of the specimen you, uh, you had in the beginning are no longer needed and to see, well, they didn't work that good, then you have the clinical trials before something really gets into the market. And with algorithms, it's not that different. Same here, you start with many, many algorithms, you will find out that, well, maybe not everyone was applicable in my situation until quite some time will pass by until it may be really used in daily practice. And this is really my very last slide with my take home messages. So right now, we do have a pretty good idea of what is possible with machine learning if we have a look at it in sort of a box. What we need is to work on the streamlining of the methods available and to really um, have access to the data and let people develop algorithms together. User-centered implementation means that we have to worry about how to get the algorithms in our PDMS into clinical workflows and the most important thing must be not only to see if the algorithm works but how the impact on patient outcome is. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we can move on. So thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and clear talk. Um, I, I would like to start with the first question. Um, you mentioned that vital signs for the prediction of the patient scores are more important than lab data. I think this was the same in the Spanish flu mm -hmm. some hundred years ago. Um, however, uh, as compared to, for example, SARS-1 in 2003, we are now in 2020 with COVID-19, mm -hmm. a situation where we uh, can, within 20 minutes, have the transcriptome, for example. Yeah. And doesn't it just depend on the sort of lab data that we use, and how could this be implemented? Yes, you're absolutely right. It really depends on the on the concept, on the on the question that you're asking. So, what um, what is the origin of the sepsis? But it also depends on the data available. So, I would say vital sign is not uh, the same as a vital sign. For example, um, often you have a timely granularity that is like you have two values per hour. So, in this case, 
this cannot be compared to a high frequency data assessment where you have maybe vital sciences, heart rate, etc., on a per second basis. And if you look at such a study and you see well what vital science was part of it, you can't really say, or you can't really see how vital science were seen in this model. And this is something that we really need to really understand how we can get it into our models and how to, to define a baseline of what makes sense. So higher granularity of vital yes. science, I understand that, but what about, I mean, at more advanced lab techniques than just measuring CRP? Oh yes, of course, so it's not only the labs that we have, it's not only the daily lab that we have on the ICU, but also the question of point of care diagnostics is also uh, the quasi pseudo continuous measurement of, uh, of blood volume that we need to take into account. Uh, that may not be entered as it is in some cases right now by a nurse into the system, but that really have to be connected. So all point of care devices, it's also a question of interoperability, really need to supply this data so that they can be used in algorithms in real time. It doesn't help as much if you can say, well, if we had known this information, we would have been better off um, with the treatment. It's really also a question for the manufacturers. How can every one of those parameters measured in patient care be integrated in a digital approach? Thanks. In one of your final slides, you compared the timeline till approval of a drug with a timeline till approval of an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And you showed the similarity of the curves. Uh, is the actual time course, so the length of the development, not much shorter for the algorithm, or is that my misconception? No, you are right. It is much shorter, and it, I think it's also a process that will still speed up. So there is, of course, a difference between the drug and the algorithm development. And it's also that we have to cluster the development of an algorithm. So once an algorithm has been assessed to be useful, you can have more than one group of people working on it. And you can access it, you can evaluate it in more than one environment. And this really makes a difference to the classic drug development. Okay, no further questions from the audience. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And then we move on uh, with the discussion, I guess. Thank you. And we're now moving on to a panel discussion um, on which novel approaches and regulations are needed to test the efficacy and safety of new therapies during pandemics. And the discussion will be between the participants from Dr. Schaller, Dr. Witzenrath, um, Dr. Bergmann, um, and Dr. Riedemann. I will moderate uh, and uh, also the language and take part in the discussion. So, if you would like to come here, please, that we have it, everyone. Here. Very good, very good. I think it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So, I think there are three main topics. Yeah. yeah. Three main topics we could cover. Um, there's the part of, well, we have how to speed up and start trials. Shall we change how we do the trial? And then there's also the question about IRB approval, um, data protection. Um, so Professor Reinhardt, I would uh, ask you to start. What is the main point uh, uh, what you would start to change? We have been heavily discussing this issue already during the former pandemics and there were indeed ethical issues so that you no longer ca can through through an etiquette process and what we decided and this is published uh, several years ago that you prospectively may check out what is needed in terms of, of etiquette issues mm -hmm. so there's some some work and I think we, we need to speed down and may not it's, it's impossible to have uh, randomized controlled trials which normally need half a year or a year of preparation. So that's the issues that is not feasible in this kind of crisis where we shut down everything and the borders of the countries, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And on the other hand, and we need to overcome all defenses, uh, uh, all, all, all fences which currently 
for a right purpose, slow down these processes, but find ideas to investigate the safety and efficacy of drugs in these kind of settings. That is what it's all about, and, and I wonder what ideas also the, yeah. But that I'd be able to have meant that we already had, have an approval for a um, generic observational trial in whole Germany for such uh, a scenario, but we don't, right? So um, perhaps for the future we will have it. Any other ideas? what we should change. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. So I'm Andreas Bergmann, biochemist, chemist, and I'm, <coughs> I am in a, was responsible for the development of procalcitonin. Uh, many other biomarkers you have uh, seen today, and also the development of two drugs, including Abrezizumab, where you have seen top line results um, uh, today. I think we need to, before talk, talking about more regulatory issues. So we need to generate a deep understanding of what is happening in sepsis. So we need um, to leave the naive approach that one drug, one approach will fit for all, one technology will, will fit for all. So we need to understand what is happening in this highly dynamic and highly multimorbidic uh, situation. And there we decided um, but may I interrupt? Yeah. Sorry. But, but this question, you know, is a question of general problematic in sepsis. But we have a problem now that we need some information for a very rapid acting disease and things are changing very quickly. How do we accept, uh, uh, change things there? Can we get information out of that? Yes, so this, uh, well, this may be a misunderstanding, mm -hmm. so I didn't say we should do it slowly mm -hmm. so okay. this is a, so but this is a basis to for moving forward successfully we need to understand so sepsis septic shock that's we we, we came from um, and now we need to understand what is really happening in the end stage situation of uh, corona um, uh, patients uh, it seems that it's quite similar to what is happening in sepsis or septic shock or we learned earlier that 100% of the patients who die, they develop sepsis. So it's a no-brainer to um, assume that there may be an overlap or substantial overlap, which helps us to uh, develop better treatments and, uh, and treat patients better with the uh, current standard of care. But before that, we need to really understand what's happening in detail. And there I believe the, um, for example, biomarkers helping a lot uh, and that's what we are doing currently investigating uh, the uh, known pathways of mortality uh, which we developed for sepsis uh, to check them for uh, corona patients. Mm -hmm. okay. Professor Witzenrat, how are we going to investigate COVID-19 in the Charité? What are the obstacles? What shall we do? What shall we change? Well, um, first of all, I, I do not fully agree that we should uh, now go for sepsis because I mean the patients who die have sepsis but uh, as, as we mentioned earlier on I think this is kind of a model disease where we have a, a specific sort of opportunity which is the patient gets sick then the patient gets pneumonia and then the patient some of them get sepsis and, uh, and ARDS and so I think there is some um, possibility to Step, to step in a little earlier with a, an approach that can reduce the progression, let's say, from pneumonia to ALDS mm -hmm. or sepsis. Um, and of course, it would be wonderful to, um, to know exactly which patients will develop um, sepsis or uh, ARDS. But given the fact that only a relatively low number of patients have pneumonia, and out of them, a relatively large number of patients develop sepsis and ARDS, it is, I think, well uh, taken to treat as long as we do not have the possibility to identify the patients with pneumonia who will um, definitely mm -hmm. develop ALDS, all patients with pneumonia, and to reduce the risk uh, for developing ALDS and sepsis. With respect to I mean, what is going on at the Charité, there's a lot going on. <laughs> there are quite a number of trials we are currently um, trying to set up. Um, but, um, I mean, we, we all need very fast-track um, approach 
practice uh, and, and support from ethics and support from bee farm. Um, but um, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I, heard, I just heard today that uh, with respect to a trial that wants to repurpose the drug, uh, the bee farm reacted extremely, extremely rapidly um, within hours. Um, and so in, in, in times where we have laws passing uh, by the politicians mm -hmm. within 80 minutes, not eight months, as uh, it was done, I think, last Thursday, um, we also see that the bee farm is extremely uh, supportive. Mm -hmm. So, Raymond, what do you think? What shall change? Uh, I have a, a very concrete ideas what, you know, related to the preconditions to make that happen in, in, within this country, and then mm -hmm. maybe also what can we learn from other countries. Mm -hmm. So, um, our collaborator in China met over the Chinese New Year, considered that being like Christmas holidays in Germany, mm -hmm. four times in ten days, and got approval from the China FDA that basically was ordered to stay in place and work to countermeasure. So I do think those measures are important in such situations, and we will see in the next few days a massive amount of intensive care patients coming in. And so if we want to get trials started, we need, a, we need, I would say, first of all, in Germany, we would need a centralized approach to assess what's out there. That, to me, was so far completely missing. We're saying there are tests going on, which probably relates mostly to vaccinations, vaccines. There's RNA vaccines, there's regular vaccines, and of course, we all hope they will be developed. But there was no way that a company could register and say, this is the channel you go through if you have an idea what you could do. So to get to the appropriate people in the first place. So that's a setup question that's mm -hmm. yet lacking. Uh, the other thing so is fast approval was mentioned already. That's a precondition. But I don't think that that will be an issue once the setup is as such that the politicians want to help and the regulators are usually then not the problem. They just need the light, the green light to say, you should work rapidly on this one now. And um, so it's really a coordination question. Then there's one point that I really learned from what we hear in China. Um, there, is, there are drugs, and you know, I think the, the biggest push worldwide is done by Gilead. They're, they're planning to recruit over 2,000 patients in seven running trials or so, impressive. Um, there, and in order to recruit high level trials, be, be it in very early, approaches to stop the, the disease from moving forward, or be it in the critically sick, you need to have approval with a drug, with a new drug, and you go through the authority and you may get that hopefully fast. But one problem we see is in China, for example, there are hundreds of investigator-initiated trials and patients are thrown at with malaria, um, viral medicines from, from all, like, all types of repurposing of it. And the problem is that those drugs that are, have undergone that mechanism, evaluation mechanism to say, now you get approval from an FDA, German Paul Ehrlich Institute, or B Farm, that then have difficulties to recruit because there's a massive amount of trials going on. In this case, it was this Chinese traditional medicine and others. And I think it's very difficult if you do not coordinate that, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a good idea if the authorities think of how to prioritize, work with people like Dr. Witzenrad to say, guys, these are the trials that we have authorized to run in this country. Please help recruit them, well, right? Because otherwise, every local investigator starts another trial repurposing a drug, repurposing, and this can be very dangerous because um, it, it disables that two, three, four, five high-class trials are run. So that's one learning I took from from, from the situation in China. So I, I do think setup is important. Setup is very important. I do think coordination is mm -hmm. missing so far here. And I do think that, I mentioned in my talk, we should not give up hope. We have good science in Germany. We should really make at least a push to bring it to the patient in a coordinated form. But it should not stop with the approval. It should really engage the intensivists that understand how to treat these patients. And, uh, and, and engage the units, the, the, the hospitals where we have these patients. Uh, if that could be done, I think we could run quickly high-class trials in Germany, and I'm, I'm sure there are efforts on the way, and I, I hope we can get this done quickly, because what, you know, I get like every other minute an email from colleagues 
Netherlands, Italy. Uh, I mean, things are getting pretty grim right now. Well, the centralization in the federal system is not so easy as it seems. I want just to mention one aspect, um, also because of the risk prediction, because I'm also involved in some kind of risk prediction idea, but the problem facing at the moment is, well, data protection. How do we do it without, for example, consent? Is it possible, you know, because other countries allow it for a very low risk, and if you only collect observational data, there's not really a risk for the patient. So perhaps we will, I will also get some ideas from you how, how to handle low-risk studies like this kind of thing, like risk prediction. Do we need informed consent? Do we should have opt-out options? But would it even be good for such a study because you want all uh, patients in the study and not people getting out again? Um, Professor Reinhardt. Yeah. Uh, my suggestion would be just to follow up whether the scientific community in Germany or in Europe would be able to push to overcome these obstacles. Uh, I know that in the US there's this bio, bio thing, then what, what is the, uh, the yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a centralized yeah. procedure. Uh, the, the kind of uh, department of health agency uh, in cooperation, I don't know, with, with the FDA or so, who, who screen, so just to overcome, when I hear that we are doing several studies here, so, so, so you, you get lost in translation, and, and, and so there should be a scientific body who figures out, and on the basis, what is there in terms of Safety signals, uh, in, not only in animals, but also in, 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 in humans, and what, which suggests to the authorities with which priority uh, this and that should be done. So, bec because what I learned, for example, what it has been doing in, in somebody in, 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 in Schwabing, they tried uh, some AIDS uh, antiviral compound in a single patient. So, and and they are. And if you look in the Frankfurter Allgemeine from, from Sunday, you, you find about 10 or 15 therapeutics. So there must be a body who, a, a kind of an advisory board, who, who screens the data and says, uh, so this is, these four or five perhaps are promising. Let's do it and let's do it in ways that are fast. And in discussion uh, uh, with Dr. Rilman, it, he came up with some ideas that would be different from setting up randomized control trials because uh, in half a year this may be also over. And, and you won't be finish, able to finish uh, a large uh, randomized control trial. Well, I'm playing devil's advocate now. The problem with such an approach would be that you might lose a chance when you have a rationale also to try another substance. Uh, so how would you argue, argue Dr. Wittmann, that we do several studies? And my other point is we could think about you know, adaptive designs where you start with several and lose the ones where there is no effect very quickly. So um, first of all, I'm I always thought that I'm an optimist, but I think uh, <laughs> Professor Reinhardt is more the optimist than I am, because I don't think that in half a year everything is over. Um, so I think we will have more than enough patients for uh, two or three studies, um, unfortunately. Um, I, I just wanted to, to get back to your mm -hmm. earlier question, um, and, and what about um, getting data from patients and understanding the disease a little bit more and getting um, more ideas about prediction of wanted to mention that there is a register being set up um, by the German Society mm -hmm. of Infectious Diseases with a very low granularity but with the advantage that every hospital even without any clinical trial structure can uh, put in data there mm -hmm. and they do not need informed consent because it's an anonymous register. Yeah but the, at the moment it's only on the ICU level? No it's uh, not only on the ICU level. Yeah okay so we are working on the same thing. <laughs> smaller granularity mm -hmm. um, or higher granularity um, which 
uh, is uh, getting um, data on the clinical courses, on the treatment, and on the um, pre-comorbidities, um, and uh, also biosampling. And uh, then there is uh, another um, initiative trying to get even more data on, on biosample cells of patients up to um, single cell uh, sequencing from, from these patients as, as soon as possible. And I think there will be hopefully some support for that from the German Ministry of Education and Research. So there is a lot going on trying to really get solid data and, and very quickly understand is this novel disease something that we can compare with community acquired pneumonia as we know it? Because at the moment we even do not know that. Can we use the already established um, markers and predictors um, and, and scores that we use for uh, pneumonia, for example, for, for normal community acquired pneumonia for this disease as well. Um, and, and yeah, how can we better treat pneumonia patients? Dr. Beckman, I wanted to ask you, um, would you go in this direction too, that there is a central body in Germany which decides which studies to do, which right. advises, right. advises, okay. Right. <laughs> So who, if you would know me, uh, you would know that I always try to walk the a different way. Uh, mm -hmm. So and, and and therefore I think this is everything is fine. But uh, it was many mentioned we have not much time. Uh, so we uh, talking about uh, large scale studies, organizing studies, and these things. So um, um, a phase two clinical trial. So we have done with 300 patients. So this was two years. Uh, Let's imagine a phase three, maybe three years. Um, so and if you combine that, you know, um, I think everything is over or the problems are, are uh, uh, so sub substantial that, that, that we have no chance to, influence, uh, to have an influence on that. Therefore, I think we, um, before talking too much about what we you know, can do from a technical point of view and organizational point of view, I think we need to have, uh, find study designs where we have um, where we are able to define endpoints which are e very easy surrogate endpoints for, s for success of a drug. Uh, and for that, first of all, we need drugs which are um, influencing a very specific pathway and the endpoint could be the beneficial uh, influence on that pathway. Uh, so, um, so I think biomarkers today help a lot and I just came from a meeting in Washington with um, and uh, so they just accepted biomarkers uh, even to be not only as inclusion criterion also as uh, endpoints for clinical studies and this is a huge chance to uh, accelerate studies uh, to have um, uh, not uh, not no need to have too much uh, statistics by having very um, um, effective endpoints so for example if you make a statistics in mortality which we have done in the adrenos 2 trial with uh, where we use ad uh, adrenocytumab okay so you have a placebo statistic uh, per a mortality of let's say 28 29 percent and then a relative reduction of something um, if you treat the patient so for that you need to do some statistics you need many patients but Imagine, for example, what we have, we have seen it in um, uh, Fortizumab, which is the antibody which is uh, uh, inhibiting the DPP3, um, and that this antibody instantly normalizes um, uh, shortening fraction, ejection fraction and, um, 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 uh, of the heart. Um, and this could be, for example, an endpoint. So I don't want to uh, say we should use this or the other drug, but um, but we should, we need to find endpoints which are quick and allow us a very early estimation of the drug may be uh, efficient in the disease or not. So, and, um, so I, I would like, I, I would wish that we have uh, many successful drugs which we can put at the start. And if we would have these problems, we have uh, discussed, so having too many candidates. But this is finally, from my point of view, not true. So we have many ideas and a few candidates, which we where I think would be sufficient room to, uh, to run studies. But again, we have not sufficient time. So and endpoints, uh, so-called surrogate endpoints may, may happen. Yeah, but the surrogate endpoint, on the other hand, it's nice for us and we can publish a nice result, but at the end, the clinical endpoint is relevant. So 
It must be a clinical relevant surrogate <laughs> endpoint. So heart function, kidney function, okay. lung function, mm -hmm. and at the end mortality mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, this is the, the holy grail target. But uh, again, coming back, uh, so if we would go the, uh, for example, mortality endpoint way, this needs time. So yeah, this is, uh, and we don't have the time. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that you, you cannot easily run a mortality study, but I don't think that the authorities would make you run a mortality study. I mean, even the studies run right now, the big ones I mentioned, the Gilead, mm -hmm. which is, they have response criteria defined or clinical responses at 28 days, for example, where they say you're a partial responder, full responder, and this is something that authorities like. Um, uh, and it is, in a way, a surrogate endpoint for if you have more people out of trouble, you theoretically should have less people dying. Now, the problem with the endpoints in those trials is it's very different whether you treat 600 patients that have a positive test and you want to make that a negative test mm -hmm. versus if you have 600 critical care, care patients to treat. There's a very different trial to that. And if we put this in, a, in an academic discussion around endpoints, we're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the approach to develop a vaccine, it would be very different, or what Gilead does now to treat patients early to stop viral replication and you need to treat 400 patients to show th something, to show that these don't transition so much into the worst case scenarios. Uh, that's a very different setup. Now, if we're thinking into treating critically ill patients, which is where the fear right now comes from, and I mentioned that, I think, uh, yeah, really with Dr. Bergman, we have to look into a very different type of trial design and discuss relevant endpoint, but not so much only with authorities, but with the people that treat these patients. Because when you design a trial and endpoint, you need to know the disease, because if you want to run the statistics and you don't know the variability of your endpoint, it's a shot in the dark. And so we can learn from other trials. We can learn from oncology. We can learn from rare diseases, where you search a signal, right? We know that from oncology, like the basket trials, you want to search for a signal, but the problem is, you should have experts, intensivists that treat these patients, mm -hmm. being in charge with the company, with the authorities, mm -hmm. to search the signal. And then let them say, okay, now we have a signal, now we focus in on it, and now we recommend to the authorities, we the expert panel. So it will be a, a rapidly, like, a very different approach where you actually not have an interaction only between the company and the authority, but you have the people there that treat these patients. You, you hear the people, that what is meaningful for them. Because we may think it's hard, hard ejection fraction, but maybe those guys think the one thing we need to look at is, for this treatment is another endpoint. And here we, we, I think we can do something different. And I, you know, again, we can learn. In oncology, we do that in rare, difficult to treat diseases where it's implausible to make trials with placebo groups. There's also ways to get drugs approved. So I do think we need to apply this concept and dare as companies, also maybe as authorities, to have experts come in and have a say too. But shouldn't you, you know, to tackle it together yeah. and not just between company saying I want an approval now and authorities mm -hmm. saying you have enough safety data. There must be something outside that box. And but shouldn't I you talk to the Italian intensive care uh, uh, doctors then? Because otherwise he would need some time now again until you have uh, all the experience in the German system? Now, I, I, I can tell you what I know mm -hmm. from Italian, Italy right now. Mm -hmm. Catastrophic situations mm -hmm. on some intensive cares with violent scenes, people being forced off the ventilator when they are too old, etc. Mm -hmm. I don't know we want to see this, but we may. And that's why I'm really advocating to, to set up something now to tackle this part of the disease, the severe part of the disease. Yeah. I really, I really I think this is, for example, something. in the Charité, in the last uh, <laughs> uh, weeks, I would say we are preparing for the things, but for your argument to discuss the study and the endpoints, um, you, would have, you would have to talk now with people. That was my argument. Oh, okay. So, yeah. which, which already have the experience. So, yeah. you know, instead of now searching for intensivists in Germany, my argument would have been to go to Italy or go to Spain or France. So the question is, Mayor, where do you recruit those experts? Yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's a very good, sorry, I misunderstood that point. I think that's a very good point. And we, I, I have done that a lot with our China connections mm -hmm. to understand. I assume, yeah. But again, then there's a different healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you cannot superimpose mm -hmm. what you learn easily on everything. 
But with that respect, you're right. We should have folks that have seen 20, 30, 50 patients of these on their ICU mm -hmm. uh, from wherever. Italy is still certainly a place where they have that problem right now. And see what can we learn and what would they bring in as a scope? What should we focus on? That's, I mean, sorry, I misunderstood your point, have but you that's ever, a very good point. Okay. Last one, 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 one. Have you ever approached the European Society of Intensive Care? You know, it's like, look, I'm, this is all theory right yeah. now. <laughs> right now, I'm really thinking we should do something. Every, mm -hmm. Everyone should do something. We, as, as industry, companies, will not recruit trials. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, you have to think about the collateral damage. We have cancer trials that will not recruit patients mm -hmm. because of this. We have uh, so many needed drugs that are not moving forward right now. So if we as an industry don't think about how do we tackle this problem, we're going to stand on the sidelines for the next year or so and not doing anything. So yes, I am thinking about it because I think everybody will because we have to do something. And you know, I, I, I do think we can do something. It's just we need probably to think outside the box. Okay. okay. You uh, rightly mentioned um, uh, Essican uh, or European. I think we, we should start to, to think European and bring together the people and the organizations on the European level but also on the national level because still we have this national so from my uh, perspective so we should bring together pulmonology, infectiology, sepsis, IC, I, 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 ICU, also, of course, virology, and, and because otherwise, just to have individual approaches, so the cabinets has some ideas because they think this is a good opportunity to get a grant uh, from uh, the BF right now to address some questions you mentioned in terms of logistics, which is fine, but, but if we burn this down, how get we compound, evaluate it, quickly, which for, for which is a really good rationale and at the same time no major safety concerns which come along with some of these antiviral drugs, be it the old AIDS stuff, uh, which currently is tested or, or so, 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 so that's why I th I, I'm, I'm thinking because if you want to convince policymakers from anything you need to have data and you, you have to have trustable people uh, which are not, um, that we know, we know that the current, the current from the Netherlands, the current president of Ezekiel is from the Netherlands. The, the president elect uh, from Milano is, is treating a lot of these patients. We know that uh, um, f from uh, Greece that there is uh, s starting a similar situation, etc., etc. So, and, and this should be enough now to call, uh, yeah, to, to, because you, you, you may not make this too much um, a discussion between societies as such, because you know there, there are these different interests, but, but this is a situation which asks for new approaches and, and, and there may be experts in, uh, including Esquid or, or whatever, uh, um, uh, and, 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 and just to discuss this potential novel approach, especially that we new, new, need new endpoints. Uh, and and to and, and I, I think this this idea, uh, which probably obviously, obviously comes from oncology, to yeah, to, to, to check on a. Uh, on an expert basis, um, whether you are doing harm or you see nothing uh, after you have done 10 or 20 patients, and then uh, readjust. And of course, there's also, uh, I, I don't get the, 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 the right name uh, for these uh, trials that we have been doing, where you can include different uh, telephonic approaches and then you select out of the practices. Adaptive kind of adaptive designs. So, but I, I think to be fast, one would need such a kind uh, uh, of, of, of approach. So I, I fully agree um, that we need obviously therapies and uh, no matter whether they are 
viral replication inhibitors or adjunctive therapies as we discussed them today. Um, and of course, it makes a lot of sense to use repurposable drugs uh, because we have to be quick and, and now we need the trials for this. But at the same time, I think we really have to understand this new disease that no one really has mm -hmm. understood right now because only if we get a closer picture of uh, or a clearer picture of this disease, we will be successful with the trials with the other genetics. Because at, at the moment, we are not really understanding which of the of the ideas that all the people have could be um, uh, could be um, successful. In the end. I, I really believe that understanding the disease is key because, and that's something where I'm really amazed. You know, the paper I um, went into a little bit, and some papers, I mean, they're out there for three, four weeks now. After the last epidemic, it took a year to see three, three papers like this, and they're out now. So you, we have, we are already getting better and understanding faster what we're treating. It's, for me, it's really more how do you pull the resources together. That's why I really like your question. How do you learn from what's happening in Italy? Now, when we talk about learn about it, like how do we not run out of uh, toilet paper? That's not what I mean. You know? <laughs> and you know, I mean, what I mean is how do we learn from the expertise mm -hmm. of the people outside the crisis management, which is, I don't want to make bad jokes about this, is really important as well to manage crisis. It's, it's, it's fundamentally important. But I do think we're not right now focusing on what we can learn scientifically from these people that we may bring something to take that fear away. If we can preserve our ICU capacities because we've just lost less, less people getting there, getting to this bad point, that's how we could handle the crisis. And, and I don't see right now how people even have the fantasy that we could do that. But I do think it can be done. It just maybe requires a different approach and a little bit push. But one thing, sorry, I have to, one thing that I have to really mention, I do think a prerequisite is that the, 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 the combination of political will to do this, what we just discussed, together with giving the authorities that like the, the backup from the political side to do it, the regulatory authority. Yeah, okay. This combination is really making a powerful push forward. Mm -hmm. And right now we are more in the modus where every politician, I mean, we see that with, uh, with, uh, with our friends in America, wants to have a, a success story and, and brand it with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is something that we, we need to be very, very, very careful about because this is not how we make progress. We, we need the other way around, the politicians saying, we need to get there, we define a goal, and I'm gonna help you get there. And um, because I'm sure we could approve a drug, we could repurpose something and find some surrogate, which when you ask those experts from Italy, they will say, okay, what are you doing there? Mm -hmm. But that's not the goal. We need to have the goal and then say, that's where we're working for. And that needs political engagement. We need a politician to get behind mm -hmm. stories like this to make that happen. I, I'm very, very convinced about it. I'm, I, I don't see that yet, but maybe we will get there in Germany as well. Yeah. Uh, I have not much to add than to encourage, to bring ideas via whatever topic, be it here Bolsina or be it uh, a coalition of uh, uh, European uh, society of criminology, Smith, ASA, European Psychiatric Alliance, and and ESICAM, uh, and just to to to, to organize and uh, uh, half a day or or discussion to to figure out what really is needed, not in the long term to understand what the lessons learned after the thing is over, but really to get uh, those drugs current and approaches tested as long as this is possible and is going on because if this if we would be able and look at a trial like like your trial where you have a 30 percent reduction of mortality in a in and i am convinced having looked at this paper that we read this lancet paper and then there there are others that, that this is just even a, a, a virus that induces more cytokine storm and uh, these uh, things <laughs> that we always have identified with, uh, with, with sepsis. So it, it, it would be at the end, if you can demonstrate that 
whatever compound is effective in this clear setting where there's no surgical issues and, and, and mm -hmm. stuff like this where people die from. Um, so this would give a push to the, to, to, uh, would end up with help for all other sepsis people who might suffer currently because they may, uh, or also cancer people or whatever. So, so, so that, that's why, and, and, and policy makers only will act if they are faced by the opinion uh, of, be it European or recognized uh, German um, societies or, 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 or bodies. And we cannot wait for a statement of the Leopoldina or so where we are working on, 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 on sepsis because these processes are too long. No, we, we have to find other ways and, and that, I think, would be my proposal that we think about it and, 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 and initiate. We could take perhaps this little symposium here and, and, and address this question, invite representatives from those society that we have, societies that we have just mentioned. And the networks are there. They are there from, at least from, from your company. Uh, they, they are, we are connected to, to core knowledge, to infectious disease. So, and, and, and so, so, so that's, I think, because otherwise, you, you see, the, what, what France does just to try to buy this company in, in Tübingen, so uh, sees how, what, what policy, policy makers are, are doing and thinking in this situation. Uh, and, and if we can provide them with not out of any conflict of interest that a single company or even a single per person may have, but uh, from, from, from a general perspective. So I think this is the only way to go. Otherwise, we, we, will, we will, yeah, yeah, so. Okay. I, so I think I would like to sum it up a little bit in uh, a call for other one hand studies which investigate the pathomechanism mechanism and the different causes of the disease on the one hand. And I think they are a little bit easier to do than clinical trials investigating uh, from the regulatory standpoint at least, uh, uh, um, then clinical trials investigating medication or drugs. And here the purpose was to say, okay, really make an effort to work together to get perhaps on a European level, as I said, the, the people together who have treated that, those patients together with industry and also push through policy makers so that things really change so that the trials can be done quickly. And involve also WHO because they have these bodies, and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we invited some of these people, uh, uh, and at least they will have the, uh, have the possibility to follow this discussion. So, so we, we should also get them involved because they have a, a group. They had this group for Ebola, and they have it now mm -hmm. uh, also for this. And and uh, so I think this makes this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make a final comment uh, for the? Yeah, a closing. Yeah, I think it was worthwhile <laughs> that we met, um, and uh, I hopefully uh, everybody, not only this small uh, group of people who are sitting here, um, has understood uh, um, what the next steps uh, should be. I also hope that uh, because we know that also perhaps some uh, patient advocacy groups and people and, and some patients uh, have uh, followed these uh, discussions and perhaps also some representatives of healthcare authorities have yeah, heard uh, our what is out there in Germany uh, and not, o not only uh, in the US. And, and, and if we want to make the most out of it, I think we should follow some of these ideas that have come up. I would like to thank this place, um, especially those who have made this uh, possible uh, in terms of uh, technology. Uh, and I think uh, Katja and Marvin uh, and also uh, Patrick Heron, um, uh, who is, um, has left already, uh, have made this possible within 48 hours, more or less, because it was not clear that this event will be happening. <laughs> or not, 
And uh, I think also, of course, we all the investigators and CEOs who have, despite the fact that Zepsis has been called the billion dollar graveyard, uh, still stick to this idea uh, to make a difference. And there's no better chance than this tragic pandemic, but we can make something out of it if we draw the right conclusion and act now. So thanks you, all of you, and uh, I think uh, it was worthwhile everybody's effort.